This is the full interview with John Hare recorded for my developer spotlight on Sensible Software. If you haven't watched that, you can find it in a link below. This was recorded early 2021, so the info on Sociable Soccer is quite outdated now. It's currently available on Apple Arcade, coming to PC and consoles in 2023. Keep up to date with that or John on Twitter or at sociablesoccer.com. We talk about Sociable Soccer, the games industry in general, and of course, sensible software. I've edited a few bits out and the pleasantries at the start, so we'll jump right in. Hope you enjoy. Yeah, just yeah, like I said, starting at the start, kind of before uh, yep. before sensible software. What was your history in in computers and 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 interesting games? Well, I mean, I had no inter- uh, no history in computers at all uh, when I started. I mean, I started making games in 1985, um, so there's no such thing as a games industry then. There was no such thing as games as a career, or you know, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't around. So basically. Um, I started making games uh, because a friend of mine, uh, Chris Yates, I was at school with Chris, and uh, we started playing in a band together in the in the fifth year at school, the old fifth year, which was like called year. I have to remember it, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's year eleven in modern parlance. Um, and uh, yeah, we 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 um, we went. We met each other going to a gig and came back. We found out we liked the same kind of music and. Uh, we formed a band and we started to write songs together. And then back in the, this is back in 1981, I'd have met Chris, I think, 81. Might have even been late 1980, something like that. Anyway, we get to 1985 and uh, we, um, we, we're playing this music and we both gone to college and we both kind of dropped out of college because we wanted to do our band thing uh and it was the, it was the it was the old thatcher years you know so in those times there weren't a lot of jobs like you left school it's like what job can i do well there aren't any so um they uh it meant that the government needed to support pioneer businesses a little bit more um, a bit like we might have coming up around here in a year or two, where like mm. you've got so many people out of work, they need to find solutions to deal with this problem, uh, unless they all go and work for Amazon. Uh, so, um, so what we, we were both like, uh, just I was around Chris's house, we were making music, and he said, Right, I'm going to try and get myself a job as a computer programmer or teach myself how to program. So he was using these old K's and Littlewoods catalogues to get a, a spectrum at the time. It was ZX81 at the time. And you could get them for a month and you could send them back. Like, so oh, I don't want it. And he did it three times in a row and taught himself how to program and got a job. So he managed it. On the third one, he, he got a good demo together of Snoopy flying around on the kennel. Uh, got himself a job with a local company called LT Software. And um, uh, they got him to make a game called Sod Off the Sorcerer, which was a which basically it was a conversion uh, onto the ZX81 from a different machine. And uh, I was at Chris's house one day and he was doing this new work he'd done. And uh, he couldn't do the art for it very well. And I like did art at college or theatre design stuff. So I said, I'll have a go at doing the art then. Why not? I'll try it. So I just, for a bit of fun, messed around and drew some wizards and some dragons and stuff. Although the dragons look a bit like T-Rexes when I look back at the art. And... Um, but anyway, the, the company liked my work. So then the company offered me a job. So now me and Chris were both working for the same company as young consultants. We were both 19 at the time. And, uh, and uh, yeah, after we'd done that game, then they commissioned us to do a game on our own, a game called Twister, which was the first game we actually did. Do you know Twister? Yeah. Yeah, so Twister was the first game we got commissioned to do on our own. And whilst Chris was doing sort of the source, I was also do I was also doing graphics, bits and bobs of graphics on other games as well. And uh, so Twister was done on the Spectrum, which was the first game we done in color, and it was the first game we did together with a two man band. It was pretty good for a Spectrum game. It wasn't great. It was okay. It was for us. It's not a bad start. And uh, of course, we were working for. 
LT software at the time and it was coming out for system three. So we weren't officially sensible software, didn't exist. But we decided we want to set our own company up called Sensible Software. So we put a little cheat key in that you could tap something in that it says buy Sensible Software. If you tap some combination of spectrum keys, it comes out and says that. So that was um, a bit of fun. And uh, then when we finished that, we were like, okay, we can make a game. And it got reviewed and it was okay. And we're like, great. Okay, we know, we know what we're doing now. And uh, so we then came uh, aware of this government enterprise scheme. You know about this? No, no, no. Right, so the government enterprise scheme was a government scheme at the time, specifically because of young people like us who couldn't find work. And what they'd said is, we will allow you to set your own company up and we'll pay you £40 a week per person to set your own company up. We were like, well, when we were young, £40 a week wasn't a lot, but we were both living with our parents at the time. So it was affordable. Um, and... Uh, Chris lived with his dad, and his dad was away a lot, which was great. Um, uh, but it meant we had a place to work from, like the spare bedroom in his house was a legitimate place to go to work. So we're like, okay, we can do this. The only snag was you needed a thousand pounds in the bank each as well, and we were both totally skint basically. So um, the only solution was to work was to basically ah, and you needed to have been on the dole for thirteen weeks. Right. Right, this is the condition, you need a thousand pound and you need to have been on the dole for 13 weeks, which is kind of a, an insane combo, right? Mm. So the only solution was to sign on to the dole for exactly 13 weeks. That's part one. Part two, to continue to work in able to have the thousand pounds we needed to start the company up. So we basically went through this period where we signed on for exactly 13 two weeks, for exactly 13 weeks. We also managed to get a contract were another game for exactly two thousand pounds between which was enough for the two of us to qualify because we needed two thousand we needed a thousand each and we made this game and actually the game never came out in the end it was it was been by the by the publisher but we got paid for this um this game called um runestone and um it was again it was a conversion to the commodore 64 from another machine but it got us going on the Commodore 64. It's kind of like a free hit of learning the Commodore 64 as well. So in March of 1986, exactly 13 weeks after we signed on, we signed off again. Um, and we just got the money in from, from this game that we didn't that didn't come out, but we kind of finished our work. And uh, then we started Sensible Software up in, in March of 1986 uh, with our £2,000 in the bank. And, uh, and that first year, I mean, knowing that you've got a little bit of money coming in each week is, is enough to get you started. And I think it also taught us an important lesson that I see a lot of companies failing on now is that people want to take money out of their company before it's really ready to pay. And we, we all automatically restricted ourselves to only £40 a week, which wasn't a lot, but enough to survive. And it meant that we weren't really, um, I think we bought a spectrum, a second spectrum for me. Or maybe Chris, maybe we need, no, sorry, a Commodore 64 for me. And maybe Chris already had one, or maybe we need to buy that. I can't remember. Either way, that was it. That was our outlay. And the rest was just me getting a bus to Chris's house. And, um, yeah, and and on that, we did Parallax. And so we did Parallax from the March until round about, and then in about the May or the June, we went down to, up to Ocean in Manchester. Uh, we managed to get them to look at the game, which was great. Uh, and they said they loved the game and they signed it up on the first day. They gave us a contract for £5,000, a cheque for, for £1,000 on our first day of business as like kids, you know. I was 20 by then. It, Chris was still 19 because I was slightly older than him in the school year. And, um, and uh, yeah, we went back smoking cigars on the, on the dinner carriage. You could smoke on trains in those days. So we went back celebrating, we were singing We're in the Money, and we, we, we were like, yeah, we've we done it. I mean, it was an awful contract, I and mean, we got totally fleeced, really. Mm -hmm. But it was a break, and, you know, Ocean were a good publisher to work for, and and we made Parallax, and Parallax built our reputation as an interesting new developer, you know. And then after that, then we then we did, I, I decided, I wanted a cup of tea, so I've, I've got a whiz ball mug, so I've got my whiz ball mug for you. Oh, yes. Is there, see? <laughs> anyway, so um, 
after that we signed the next game which was Wisbon. Uh, had we known that the royalties were unlikely to be forthcoming from the first game we might not have signed with Ocean again but right. we didn't know at the time so we signed Wisbon. we got slightly more money up front um, and Wisbon started because uh, Chris was a big defender fan and we played a lot of Archer McLean's drop zone which was the kind of inspiration for this kind of game and then we once we'd got we, we kind of had this ball moving around to get the whiz ball. We, at least it was a circle that kind of went spinning around and bounced and then bounced again. And then I drew the, the whiz ball face thing on it. So it had a bit more character. And then it, it grew from there. Then we then we, then we we grew the game out. So you, you gained weapons like Nemesis and Salamander. And those were big games at the time. So, like, you know, you managed to stabilise the movement. Then you got the firing the, firing the um, bullets and then... The catalyte and then collecting the droplets and everything else it all just came out it's like a lot of most of our games happen from an idea you do it you execute it well you're happy with that part then you bolt on the next idea then the next idea and continue to grow it out and that's how the earlier games we made worked like that mm-hmm. so they kind of organically evolved yeah. uh, which was a style which pretty much carried on i think Towards the end of what we were doing, we realised that we needed a little bit more sophistication in the process of making them. I think when we hit Megalomania, which is much later, but we, we stumbled upon, that was kind of, we realised that we really needed to plan what we were doing more from the start with Megalomania, because it, we really stumbled upon Megalomania by a very roundabout route. So when we did Cannon Fodder after it, it was very it was a very organized approach i planned it all out from the start so but it back back in the parallax and whistle days we were literally free for me just like we'd write music it was kind of like the same approach mm. and they're quite it was quite arcadey kind of games in that day wasn't it yeah i mean everything like um yeah everything was inspired by arcade machines everything i think i think most of us developers in in the uk we were I mean, you've got things like Jet Set Willie and those, which I guess weren't so much, but a bit. But we were really uh, riffing off of um, arcade machines, even like we did uh, after those two. We did Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit, which is about making your own shoot 'em ups. Then we did Micro Pro Soccer, which was direct rip off of Take On World Cup. Uh, we did um, Oh No, which was a direct rip off of a game called Rip Off. Uh, Galaxy Birds was, was a Galaxians thing. Like a mm-hmm. mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, Insects in Space was again another defender kind of type game. So, yeah, like nearly all of them. In fact, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and right, up, right up to right up to MicroPro Soccer, it was just taking the inspiration from the, the arcade games, yeah. Mm. Well, I suppose the Shoot Micro Construction Kit was quite uh, a unique concept. And how did that, how did that come about, that idea? Um, Shoot Micro Construction Kit uh came about by a very curious way so uh we'd realized that we were, we were making these games and they were taking us about <clears throat> eight or nine months and we were getting okay money for them you know it was, it was in those early days we were making enough to survive to live off of you know it was good it wasn't great you know but it was it was good and games like Wisborne parallax i mean Wisborne got great critical acclaim but it didn't really make that much money you know so it was kind of, it was all right. It was all, what can I say? It was all right. We got our advance, which was eight grand. We got no more than that. We, our royalty checks from Ocean always mysteriously said zero at the bottom. Mm. Um, so when we did Chew Up Construction Kit, the idea was that Chris would make a utility for me, and then I could do the art, and we could knock out a whole bunch of games fast, and we could make more money. That was the plan, right? That was the, the basic plan. Uh, we can make our own internal factory of game making if you like however after five months maybe we realized that the quality of games we could get out of our our machine wasn't as good as something like whistle or even parallax and never would be like it's just there was a limitation on what you could do by this the, the manner we'd done the construction kit however the construction kit is a tool to use because I was using it every day. It was fantastic. So I suggested to Chris, 
we should just sell the tool and forget about this idea about making games people will buy. I mean, I ended up making four demo games uh, in there and, and, and my job became make the demo material to as the examples of what you can do. But basically, we decided to just hone and refine the tool that Chris had given me until you got up to a level where it was really, you know, could be used by by by, by players, uh, which turned out to be a smart idea. I mean, that was actually our first number one game, shooting up construction kit with um with Palace. So yeah, that was that was that was. It was nice to like to go into something with a bit of variety to it, and I guess that was the first bit of real variety. Uh, 1988, which would be the year after Martin Galway came on board. Is that right? That year, Martin, yeah, because we, I mean, we'd done, we'd done, um, Whisper and Parallax with Martin anyway. I mean, he was part of Ocean, but he'd done the music yeah. for it, so we knew Martin well. We liked him, and he was obviously a brilliant games musician. So, yeah, Martin joined us roughly in '98. Um, and the intention with Martin was because. When you've got a games musician, you know, it doesn't take a lot of time to do the music compared to the rest of the game. So a musician will tend to come in at the end of the game for a month, maybe if maybe even a few weeks in some cases. Um, and obviously you've got sound effects as well, but all in all, it's not that much work. So we didn't have enough. We didn't have enough work for Martin for him to be a full time just a musician. And at the same time, we realised that, um, and part of the reason we'd even made shoot up construction kit was that, as an artist, I could make more games worth of art in a month. In, you know, I could make a game's worth of art, say, every three months, whereas the programming took six months. So you realise that I could make the art for two games at once. And uh, design-wise, Chris and I pretty much shared the design in most of the stuff. But uh, we decided there was a game, you know, next game we did chris could work on one game with me and we kind of share the design i do the art but then there's another game i could do with martin as a lead programmer and um i would do the art work with martin and i would be more involved in the design of controlling that one with martin um so that was the plan and we made a game called um did we get the name right touchstone now yeah. So Touchstone was actually named after our band. So me and Chris mm. had a, a band at the time called Touchstone. I just realised in the back there I've got an old cassette and that is Touchstone. That's our actual band demo. Oh, wow. Day. So... I was listening to some earlier, actually. <laughs> oh, to that, on the video. It might have been the uh, same band, yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah. so that, that's touched on. That was, uh, that, we went through a bunch of different bands, but that was that band. And um, and uh, we we started making the game, which was a pretty ambitious uh, kind of... We, we were talking a bit with the guys from Ultima, the guys who make Ultima at the time, Origin Systems, and we were looking at doing a game that was um, a kind of uh, adventure in the same sense, but it was very ambitious. So at the time we'd been offered to work on in a space which we turned down or it didn't happen or whatever. You know the film where the, the guys go yeah, in the like, bathroom and that. Yeah. So that must have been in our heads. And so we, we had a game where you were the concept of Touchstone was that you were in a kind of medieval world. So you walk around the world, but also you did magic with runes. And um you had the plot was that your wife was very ill. And and um, and you had to heal her, and you had to heal her body. So you had to go inside her body, like like in inner space, and her mind and her soul, I think. So the soul was like the soul was like um, a place where we had these. I invented these astrology systems. We had these thirteen astrology signs, and you had to like assemble these rune things in certain places you know to get the magic something to happen and um that was the soul bit and then the the mind bit was like a series of memories she had that you had to mend so you had to mend a mind a body and a soul and part of the plot involved bringing her bringing your own dead father back to life or was it her dead father back to life to heal her so basically the, the plot was that everyone wore a rune around their neck which was the first letter of their name 
and to do the spells you needed to put the runes together to spell the the word you know the incantation and of course some guys had very rare letters around their neck like he was the only person with his name who began with that letter and that was her father i think it was her father or your father so you had to bring them back to life so you had to do a lazarus spell to bring them back to life to get the final letter around their neck to do the spell that would actually finally heal her so it was a, it, the problem with the game was was it was pretty ambitious actually and unfortunately it, you got a coinciding thing where i as a designer was going right let's go for it it's the first time i'd really gone let's go for it we're not doing an arcade thing here we're doing a, like a whoa, big world you know and i hadn't i hadn't had the experience at that time of working with with a team to understand how um you can do too much as a designer you can just go too crazy and unfortunately martin hadn't had the experience as a lead programmer of knowing when to tell a designer to like reel it in so i ended up going right over here and martin was like struggling with his first lead programming on a on a commodore 64 and we signed the game with origin so we did have it signed with origin but origin put us in this kind of green light process so they had this process where you had to get to a certain point then they'd green light it and then they'd go for full production anyway the martin was finding it difficult for understandable reasons he'd not, never done lead programming before and but it's before he got to a stage where we had a really good version working on the c64 origin said you know what we really need it on the pc so then they moved over to the pc which was another th lot of stuff for martin to learn and um well, to cut a long story short, I mean, we never really, Martin never really got to the bottom of it. And and Origin lost patience with it and kind of pulled it and said, OK, we're not going to green light this. And that's what really happened. And then shortly after that, Martin left. And actually, then Martin went to join Origin anyway as their sound guy. Oh, wow. So, and he's been over in the States ever since. That's what actually happened. So that was quite fun. I mean, Origin was great. That was the first real proper foreign trip we done to America. I did, I did one trip to France with with Pete Stone from the old Stansted Airport, and went with Pete Stone, who was then the guy running Paris. And uh, we went on a on a on a small plane, relatively small plane, from the old Stansted to Orly Airport, I think, in, in in Paris. That was very exciting in those days. But that was the first time we'd gone to America, because Origin like had an office in an office in Texas in Austin, and another office in. Um, New England in New Hampshire and we went to both so it was really exciting for us didn't the guy have like a really eccentric house or something? I went to that yeah. house yeah I went to it it was amazing so yeah so Richard Garriott otherwise known as Lord British right the king of the Ultima games and his brother Robert ran um Origin and Richard was really eccentric and he would like the type that dresses up as a knight kind of thing a bit like Jason Kingsley still does, actually. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, his house was amazing. So he had, he had, he had a, a, a kind of a telescope in the roof. You could open the roof up for a telescope to look into the stars. He had an inside and outside swimming pool. So he had this swimming pool inside. You could swim through this tube. And then it kind of went into a, totally glass like an aquarium hanging off the side of his house where you could see because he was up in a hill you could see all across austin like the whole valley in the city which was amazing and my favorite bit he had a chess board in in the hallway somewhere and some chess pieces on it and he had to arrange the chess pieces in a certain order then a secret passage opened up wow and throw it to another bit of the house so yeah and it I mean, it was like, it was a bit like, like big kid stuff, really, you know, and he would have like big Halloween parties and the guys from the office and his friends would come around and they'd, you know, they'd do that kind of stuff. I mean, it was, it was, it was very eccentric. You know, Richard went to space in the end. I believe he flew. Yeah, he did. He recently well, on the, one of the on guys the went up on one of those NASA things and went and oh wow, tried it out. Yeah. Crazy super guy. jealous, super jealous of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> oh, nice dear. guy, by the way. Really nice guy, but crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then we got Micro Soccer. Mm -hmm. So is was that kind of the um 
like an early concept for 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 sensible soccer do you think um i would say it's kind of like a i mean <clears throat> me and chris both like football i really love to take on world cup the arcade machine do you know that no not really like, to take on world cup was a pretty early tabletop machine so basically it's a flat table so you're looking at screens mm -hmm. from above and you had a trackball either side and two buttons and to move the players you had to do like this with the trackball it really really hurt this bit of your hand when you played it, actually to mm. move them around then you had like a button for pass and a button for shoot i think so um but the viewpoint of it it came out for one of the world a uh, world cup i guess it must have been i don't know what world cup probably the 86 world cup i'd have thought yeah but um it had the viewpoint we stole and put in micro soccer so that kind of scale of pitch sprites came from take on world cup um and uh we wanted to call that game sensible soccer in fact we did call it sensible soccer and we went and pitched it around to different companies and Microprose, who are an american publisher uh surprisingly offered us said they were interested in the game they offered us thirty thousand pounds, which was the most we'd ever been offered for a game by then. A big mark up on the five later, it's not bad. But the catch was they wanted to call it micro soccer instead of sensible soccer. So we were like, okay, thirty grand was good, and we, we were like, okay. And they said, and we'd like you to do American indoor soccer because they play six aside soccer indoors in America, and then. Yeah, and that we added that, so we added that piece. It was international teams. It was a lot of fun that game because we added rain. But people have done that. We added this like a rewind thing where you can where you can like rewind the goals and do a videotape effect, and it went black and white. And there was a lot of touches. We added these overlaid sprites. So we had a coloured sprite and then a black and white thin sprite over the top to give a kind of like an outlined diff, different definition. So there's a bunch of technical innovation in Microsoft Soccer as well as a good football game for the time a bit slow now if you play it but good uh, and we put ball bending in it and we put the ball bending in it because in my in take on world cup um the ball you could see it was bending slightly as it went towards the goal now we didn't realize i read about this a couple of years ago but that was actually a bug like the guy had not written his straight line code properly so sometimes it bent but we turned it into a proper real mega banana kick kind of thing but yeah, I mean, it was a, it was at the time CMBG called it the best sports game on any machine ever. So at the time, it was, it was yeah, it, it did it did its thing, and um, I guess it was a precursor to sensible soccer. In as much as we'd done a football game before, we knew how to make one. Uh, we knew we were good enough at it, and really the hierarchy for football games kind of went. From a football game player's point of view, went micro pro soccer. Well, obviously there was stuff like match day and things preceding it. But then you go micro pro soccer. Then you go kick off, kick off two. Then you go sensible soccer swas. That's kind of the the hierarchy of how that kind of worked. Yeah. And then you go FIFA. And then fortunately, unfortunately, you still go FIFA. With the yeah, so FIFA forever. <laughs> and coming up, up and down occasionally. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Never mind. Um, so then it was kind of transitioned to Amiga uh -huh. from, from Commodore. Um, was that like a huge jump technically, the, the hardware? You know what? Actually, we found the transition really, really easy. Uh, we, we did a game called International 3D Tennis. It's quite an obscure one. Um, but that was our first totally cross-platform game. So that was Commodore 64, Amstrad maybe even, plus... Amiga, ST, and PC, I think. So it went across 8-bit and 16-bit. Uh, we did the 8-bits internally, and the 16-bit was done by a guy called Dave Korn, who, well, he, in fact, he, he joined our team anyway. Um, he was working out of a bedroom in... <laughs> a bedroom in uh, Robinson College in Cambridge, because we, we were around Cambridge, that always smelled of dope smoke in his room all the time. <laughs> um, but... He did a, a good job and um that was our first transition to amiga and at the same time we had been working with on megalomania megalomania was done with chris chapman 
who's also another Cambridge-based programmer. Um, and uh, <laughs> actually, he he worked in a he worked in an office that which was above a, a driving school in Cambridge. But the driving school was called LSD Driving School. So I always thought it was funny. <laughs> Something School of Driving. I don't know what the L stood for, but anyway. Uh, but that wasn't what Chris was into at all. But uh, um, Chris um, turned out to be, a, you know, ended up for us making megalomania and then going to make sensible soccer and swas and, and sensible golf after that. So did a lot of great work with us. Um, and uh, we did the sensible golf menus. Actually, he didn't do the game. The, the sensible golf game was done by the same guy did Cannonball and Cannonball Two. So it's like two channels of that, those things. Um, but yeah, Megalomania was very, very ambitious when it started. So Megalomania was like uh, you were flying around in space, um, firing against other spaceships, 16 different planets, and you had all these towers and you had like your, uh, your mines and your factories and your towers to defend on the planets. But at the same time as doing that, you had to fly around a spaceship and not get hit. Wow. So, so it was the same game, but pushed twenty thousand years into the future with a, you know, a, a space firing game in it as well. So it was really hard. I can't. Describe yeah, it. I, I can't imagine because that's one of my favourite games of yours. Um, and to 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 do all that and fly around ship sounds impossible. Yeah. So the the, ga the gameplay was very very similar. Imagine game. Imagine Megalomania, but you start in uh, two thousand five hundred uh, AD and you go forward in space. Imagine that. So you have got technology, but it's it's fantasy technology that you're advancing. But also you could fly between the the the, the sixteen zones. You'd fly between them, and there would be planets. And you have to fly to, to get from A to B to do your stuff. So, yeah, really bloody hard. Uh, impossible, actually, to play. So we decided, because we hadn't advanced it very much, that on the flying part, we would just kind of ditch it. And then about six months before the game was due to be finished, I noticed, and I never remember it's Populous or Powermonger, but it was a picture of a caveman on a cover. Do you know which one that is? Is that Populous or Powermonger? Um, I always get them confused. Right, okay. Not on the cover of the game. Yeah, it was a caveman. That would be uh, Powermonger. No. Powermonger? Yeah, I think Powermonger. Right, okay. Yeah. Anyway, so we saw that and we're like, it made me think, instead of having all this spaceship stuff, we could start with a caveman and go forward to, like, UFOs spaceships as the final level rather than just have endless different types of ufos like it would be more interesting and people would connect more with the history line based on stuff they know like victorians and elizabethans and normans and what have you you know so that's what we did so we we, we just basically reversed the whole uh, history line and then made the graphics about that so yeah, it meant redoing quite a lot of graphics, but not too much because we were we'd been a little bit behind with some of the stuff. So we'd been working on the the whole. I mean, Megalomania is the first game in the world that had a tech tree. Then we know that. So we weren't really deliberately consciously making a tech tree, but we were working on this thing about mining and designing and upgrading and that kind of stuff. And we were doing it almost almost from a theoretical basis at the start. So. One of the first things was like all the minerals and the names we called them and how they combine to make these different designs. So um, we just put the graphical world on top of it of this kind of like, I say the cavemen and then the Romans and the boiling oil down the medieval castles and stuff like that and the Victorian biplanes and and then it was a lot more fun to get like to get like a fighter jet flying over I don't know a guy with a bow and arrow <laughs> and he just kill him like pff. it was funny you know. So you've got this humour in it, and, and especially when you've got the nuclear weapons, it was really funny, because then you just race to get a nuclear weapon and just utterly destroy the other guy and obliterate him. Um, that was quite fun, you know. And uh, of all our games, Megalomania is the one which which kind of 
uh, it would have had really good legs. Uh, unfortunately, it really suffered from Mirosoft falling apart at exactly the wrong time for the game. Our game was number one when Mirosoft fell apart, and we were published by Mirosoft, and the whole company just collapsed. They took all our royalties with them, and the game we republished it with Ubisoft about six months later. As a double, think, that would have been well after the Christmas period and everything. Yeah. So you kind of missed out on. Yeah, it just the, it just went at the wrong time, and it's like anything. These these things. There's a lot of competition between games. So what you had in that period of time, most strongly we had this with Cannon Fodder. You had a lot of American publishers really pushing their American stuff. And if you look, if you look back in like historical sites now, you can really see it. Americans really didn't, don't care for European developed software at all. Like there's hardly any games they acknowledge, very few, you know. And a lot of that's to do with the formats that we were leading on. Like we were leading on the Amiga. The Amiga was a video toaster in the States. You know, no one played games. No one played games on, on Amigas in the States. So when you speak to American guys about historic games, the real connoisseurs now about our European, prim primarily British, but also some French stuff or whatever, they're the only guys who know about it. Most of them, all they know, knew was like a, a Nintendo systems and a PC. That's it. So what you find is the games that were very strong on the PC, actually some of the Bullfrog stuff, particularly from that era, they were strong on the PC. They tended to do better in the States than those of us like us or the Bitmap Brothers who focus more on the Amiga and the ST. We tend to do very well in the UK and France, Germany maybe, but we never made that transition so well out to the States. And the other companies that did well at that time were the ones who were working on the Nintendo formats. So that's kind of how it went. Uh, in retrospect, you can see that at the time you had no idea of knowing how that was going to go. But we noticed uh, very clearly with Canon Fodder, um, we went we went to America with Virgin Europe, uh, showing them Canon Fodder that was doing incredibly well at the time in, in, in the UK, uh, across Europe, actually. And the Americans with uh, the American Virgin wanted to show off to us Westwood Studios and that they're working on Command and Conquer. And we're like, fuck that, they're our rivals. You know, we're mm. not very happy about you pushing our rivals game instead of ours when we're publishing with you. But they were very, there was kind of like a, a war is too strong a word, but there was a lot of rivalry between Virgin US and Europe at the time. And we definitely suffered from that with Canon Fodder because I've always understood why Sensible Soccer didn't sell in the States. It's a football game. But why didn't Canafoda do well in the States? It's mm. perfect for the state, for American market. So I don't that was always a mystery to me. There was a lot of politics going on with 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 you, you feel it in in what's going on with with um with uh sensible soccer when we moved on to the consoles, which now was resonating more with the American audience. Um we we should have come out two weeks before FIFA and we got rejected because we put the Italian flag the wrong way round in the translation thing, which meant FIFA came out before us. And in retrospect, I think it was a political play. I don't think it was just a flag like reverse, like it goes green, white, red instead of red, bright, green. I think they could have lived with that in a relatively minority language at the time. You know, there weren't a lot of Italian people at least buying these units. There's loads of them. Uh, playing them <laughs> by other means. Mm -hmm. You've got to remember we had 20 to 1 piracy in those days. But um, but yeah, I mean, it, you come to realise that there was more the, the concept of market manipulation and pushing your things in America, much more than in the UK at the time. And eventually we've adopted some of these patterns. And I think that in that era, um, had had we had a different had we a been on a platform which was strong in the states i mean the amiga was nothing in the states and b had we had there not been these market forces at play where the american studios were pushing their stuff above the european studios in and in the case of ea they were pushing fifa as we now can see years on they really do push fifa and they they fight for that market and to dominate it and they've done brilliantly well at, at, over all these years you know we're talking about nearly 30 years later now well over 25 um 
but I think that that kind of affected a little bit our traction in America. Um, like I say, it's only it's only kind of that really gets to me. To a certain extent, Megalomania as well. Megalomania is a game which could have done well in America. But I then, then they rename it Tyrants Fight Through Time in the States. Yeah, we were tyrants. <laughs> we were tyrants. And actually, Megalomania was was the only game which came out in Japan. So oh, wow. it came out on a bunch of them FM towns and a bunch of them weird Japanese formats. Um, it, it made it onto into there. And we did some other weird stuff like um, Sensible Soccer came out uh, via as, as a different game name. I can't remember the name. It was called Championship Soccer 2 or something. Well, I can't remember. Oh, anyway, on the Mega Drive. We did it via Sega, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, World Championship Soccer 2. That's right. Yeah, that was that was a that was a rehash of the Sensible Soccer engine with different graphics, um, which was quite a funny thing to do, you know. So I guess we did have another another game out there, in in that kind of mold, which was slightly more bigger graphics and slightly more appealing to that side. But yeah, I mean, it's you can't win every fight, you know. I mean, mm. we had a brilliant brilliant time, so you can't win every fight. Mm. I noticed you guys didn't put your name on that one on the box. There's no we like... <laughs> absolutely did not. We were, we're actually the developers of the Mystery Chefs. Oh really? Yeah, that's um that was a that was a kind of like yeah it was a kind of um it was extra bit of way to make some money should we say you know I mean all the way up even with Megalomania I mean we were talking about Megalomania when Megalomania came out uh we. It was our best-selling game, and our turnover that year was about hundred thousand pounds. It was where we were in nineteen ninety-one, but unfortunately, Megalomania um, royalties we wrote were seventy-five thousand, which was seventy-five percent of our turnover, and we got none of it. So we were almost on the floor after that. Megal that was, that really hurt our company. That that because when Mirosoft went down. We didn't just have Megalomania signed to it. We had Sensible Soccer signed to Mirosoft and Cannonfoot signed to Mirosoft and Megalomania 2 signed to Mirosoft. And all of our stuff just went bang in one go, like a big crash. Uh, not just us, there's a whole bunch of other developers. Uh, and that 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 period of time for us and a, many, I would say half of the top developers in the UK were signed to Mirosoft. I mean, they, they've done a brilliant job signing us up. Um, and had some brilliant people at Mirosoft, but um, unfortunately, the Mirror Group was a you know castle built, built on sand, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and it came collapsing down. And then we had uh, some very eye-opening meetings between a whole bunch of us different development companies, and um, and the Mirosoft guys telling us that they wanted to retain our rights and they'd do certain things. And then we had people very experienced in business, more than so than me at the time, uh, Fergus McGovern from Probe, you know, Probe Software. Um, he was very good, him and his brother were basically telling them to get lost, you know, we'll do it a different way. And some of these guys helped us out at the time. I mean, Fergus isn't with us anymore, unfortunately, but, you know, they helped us development community acts. You had us, the Bitmap Brothers, them and various loads of other people um, helped us to get our our stuff back. Um, and then out of that, you had uh, Renegade forming, which was basically the Bitmap Brothers with Rhythm King Records came together to create a new publishing company, which was developer friendly. And so we signed Sensible Soccer after talking to a few other parties. We signed it with with um, Renegade. And we signed Cannon Fodder with Virgin. Um, and we would have happily signed Sensible Soccer with Virgin, but they said they wanted to call it Virgin Soccer. And we said, no, we're not doing that twice. We've already done it with Microprose years ago. This is going to be called Sensible Soccer. Um, and that's really was really, really the clincher for us, actually, funny enough. Um, it was great working with Renegade and Virgin. They were both great companies. And we survived. I mean, we, we had a funny moment where... Well, we went to our bank manager, and uh, I don't know. You might have heard this story before. We went to we went to a bank manager like this. Let me just get get a prop. <laughs> so we went to our, our bank manager with 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 two discs like like this. 
and we went, bear manager, look, we know we've lost 75% of our turnover and we're on the floor, uh, but we're really good and um, we're doing really well in our market and we've got these two games and they're going to make us a, a lot of money. And the bank manager, bearing in mind we're back in 1991, he said, look, you see that floppy disk in your hand? Well, that's worth 25p. And the other floppy disk is also worth 25p. So like, I can give you an overdraft for 50p. <laughs> and we went, great. <laughs> what he didn't know is that that disk was cannon fodder and that disk was sensible soccer. That's what he didn't know, you know, and the rest is history. But at that time, we were, we were in a pretty difficult position and we, we thought about borrowing money in a different way and doing things a certain way. But luckily, we got um, sensible soccer signed up pretty fast. And that gave us a little bit of money coming in enough to survive. And uh, the, the development time was very short. It was only nine months on Sensible Soccer. Um, and then Canon Fodder came out um, a little bit after that. We always also had WizKid still in the background, although I don't think we had much money coming in from it by that time. But WizKid was also a game. It was the only game that survived the Mirasoft crash. That's a pretty mad game, isn't it? It's amazing. I love whiskey. <laughs> a, lot, a lot going on there. <laughs> it was, I've got whiskey here. Look. I've got lots of props. Oh, my yeah. life is surrounded by these games. So it's my daughter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to my daughter, it's a little whiskey. There he is. So yeah, whiskey was great. I mean, whiskey was a whiskey was the last game me and Chris made together. So it's just a lot of fun. We're mm. like um, doing what the hell we wanted, like freeform jazz. Bit of fun. Yeah, you can tell actually. Um, it's got and that. a really great game. I mean, what I'm really happy with whiskey is. It really was not a commercial game. But we were very lucky that Gary Bracey at Ocean, our producer, really supported us. Like he believed in us creatively. And he gave us a lot of freedoms that we wanted and he backed us up within Ocean. So when you're, when you're making a game as a, as a developer, it's important that within your publishing company that you've got someone championing you in there because ultimately they're the guys who pay us. Yeah. And someone's going to argue our side in the office in their, in their office when we're not there, which is most of the time, yeah? Gary was great at that, so he kind of backed us up and gave us the freedom to do this stuff. And, and I've got to say, in the long term, when you look at it, people still love Whiskey and still talk about it. And we, we're now, that came out in 92, same same year as Sensible Soccer. And we're now nearly 30 years later. Hmm. And it's a pretty avant-garde game for people to talk about and remember. So, yeah, again, that's a great thing. I mean, it's, it's as a creative person, we were very lucky we were in our 20s like quite young and we we're getting a lot of our work is really really respected uh and as a, an artist that's very very satisfying to have that um but there was also another thing going on at that time so when we first made our games like we we didn't feel it was only we really parallax maybe but we weren't we were getting some attention but not too much and then we started to get number one games and we started to get talked about like we were good developers and we knew we were dealing with Wizboard and Shop Construction Kit and Micro Soccer and Megalomania. Then people were like, yeah, these guys are consistent. They do know what they're doing. You know, we had 3D tennis in the middle, which wasn't that great, but you know, there's enough mostly quality stuff coming out. Um but we hadn't really made that much money. And the only game which could have done that was was Megalomania, which died. So we were like, we we actually even when WizKid came out, it didn't really make much money. It was, it was too avant-garde. So Sensible Soccer came out in June 1992. Uh, and at that stage, Sensible Soccer was six years old. And it was, I think, our ninth game. And it's the first one that really made good money. The first one. So we'd kind of, I think by the time we got to that point, we felt we were due a bit of financial luck in the, in this in this whole thing you know we'd we'd always been in that mode where we've been surviving and you're like you're like the artists that, that people say oh they're good and but you read the stories about bands that you know like they're just about scraping along they're doing okay they're, they're not skint and in the gutter but they're not like they're just kind of like living from hand to mouth hmm. we were kind of like that i mean we did have enough to start young families and start mortgages and small houses and stuff like that but that's about the level we were and maybe people outside relative to the success we're having maybe we expect us to have more but when sensible soccer came we did make a lot of money then then the floodgates started to open um and that was that was a big game changer for us 
So are you looking at good or better deals in terms of royalties than your early one? Well, obviously better than Ocean because you ended up getting zero, <laughs> but, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in retrospect, very quickly, we accelerated this this um, money. So we started off in Ocean with a 15% of the turnover and a 5,000 advance. By the time we got to Sensible Soccer, it was a 50% royalty instead of 15. And it was, I don't remember the advance. It was, it might have been 50 or 70 or 90. I can't remember. One, something like that. It might have been 75, something like that. Hmm. Uh, and Canon Ford, I think, the same was slightly higher. But um, the 50% royalty was the important thing because it was such a big selling game. So, we just got the biggest percentage on the biggest selling game, which meant that the money's coming in, you know, for the first time you're, you're making good money for us personally. So and the way we structured our company, everyone in our company was on royalties. So if we did well, everyone did well. So it wasn't just me and Chris making the money. Of course, we made more than everyone else, but we would make sure at least half the money was going to the team. So, and, and the, the teams weren't so big. I mean, our lead program was on cannon fodder and, Sensible Soccer were earning 30% of the money the game's made. So they did pretty well, you know. Um, actually, slightly more than me and Chris would have made because we were splitting 50% between, so we made 25 each. But then on the on the um, other formats that they didn't do, on the conversions, we would get they would get a smaller percentage and we would keep our, our, our share. So I guess in the long run, we made out of the, the IPs and that, that side. But yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, it was a really good time. We had a lot of fun. We worked really, really hard. I mean, we were working well into the small hours every day. Um, but yeah, it was a brilliant time. You know, a lot of fun. Good guys, good team. We had a brilliant size team when we had six people and we were making Sensible Soccer, Cannon Fodder, Megalomania, Wizkid. That was a good era, that, you know. Hmm. I, I do get sort of with going back to megalomania i do feel like that was just uh unfortunate circumstances because it, it's such a great game mm -hmm. and uh like you were saying you know the first instance of a tech tree and it's got the uh you know the, the sort of the characters evolving through time and everything but it yeah. was also like you know which it does i don't think it gets enough credit for is it was one of the pretty much one of the first two with herzog's fi uh games of that sort that was you know um you know real-time strategy games well absolutely uh, you, thank you yeah i mean i think that in a way you could argue the same with canon fodder it's slightly rts like we were moving in that direction and um i mean in this in the uk of those kind of games the team that's probably heading the pack was bullfrog with with populace and powermonger um and we uh, sensible we kind of touched on different genres of game so we kind of touched on that for with megalomania with the, the the god game thing and then we moved to canon and we like this ability to like jump around um but we liked having safe games like sensible soccer like micro soccer before it shoot up construction kit they were very safe games we kind of tried to get a balance between really arty stuff and like really like sound stuff you know and um yeah, you're right. We didn't, and uh, and I know for a fact. Had we be, were we were an American developer, we would have a lot more uh, credit for that and a lot more presence about it. But you know, we got in our own way. We got a lot of stuff. I mean, we got sensible soccer into this list of the ten most influential games of all time. Oh, I Stanford saw that. University in 2006, and you know, we're the only Europe game developed in Europe in that list. So. Um, we every company like i've got so many friends who've run development companies like all these big british developers especially from that time i knew nearly everybody so like i can look and go i look at sensible software sometimes i go we should have sold our company earlier in 1995 when we were at our peak which is about 94 95 we signed a three million uh, pound deal with warner but we could have sold our company for more money but at the time, it's like, no, we want to make sex, drugs, and rock and roll and do our thing. And, you know, just... but think about it. And then, I, then I look back and I go, oh, hang on. 
it was a lot of money we got anyway mm -hmm. you know I, you could have got a bit more but would we have had that artistic freedom would i've had even the the freedom to to keep on going with them, maybe we should have stopped and gone you know i managed to get that that I'd always had this in me, like this over ambition in the game. If I'm not checked by a strong programmer, every time I've worked with a program who's not strong enough to check me, I hit the same problem. Like no one says, no, John, stop. And I just keep on going. And like, you need a, a program to slap you around the face and go, no, you can't do that. It's impossible. Because there's a non programming designer that, like, you've got these limits. I mean, you kind of learn to get a feeling for when to ask, is that okay? You know, after a while, you learn that, you know. but. The problem when you're paying people is a lot of people become yes men. They just go, yeah, I can do that because they want the next paycheck rather than thinking about their responsibility. Go, no, we really can't do that, you know. So occasionally you come across that kind of thing. But I mean, Sensible, Sensible Soccer sold a couple of million copies in all its things. Me and Chris were earning about a pound each each time you know each copy when you cut all the money down from the 20 pounds that the user pays we ended up in roughly a pound ish i mean the maths are really easy to do there we did all right you know mm -hmm. i mean when you get that kind of money as long as you know you can you can buy your house outright and stuff like that with it you know so um it did certainly set us in a good way and then you then you think in a slightly different way about business because you become quite defensive like when you've got when you've got there's two things you're defending first you're defending your reputation now as an artist you can afford to have the odd game book piece of music film whatever that's not great everyone understands anyone apart from ridiculous accountancy driven publishing people understand even the best artists, they, they, they put out. You know, the way it works, it's like you. It could be that I don't know, you, you run out of money, or some of the guys in the project weren't very good, or the publisher wasn't very good, or it just wasn't a very good idea, or you run out of steam in the middle. Of, there's a million reasons why. Sometimes it just doesn't quite. Or if I look at sensible software, I look at Canon for the two, and I go should have controlled that a bit more and got a bit more quality out of it. I look at Sensible Golf and I think we were doing too many games at once. When I look mm. at Sensible Golf, I go, that's the one where we just, because what had happened was we had all this time of getting this relatively small money and suddenly we had Sensible Soccer out and people thought they wanted to, a piece of us and we were wise to it and, and our prices went up, you know, our advances went up. So now we're getting like 200, 300,000 a game advances. And like a few years earlier, we'd been struggling to get 50. So we were we were keen to cash in whilst we, we were of value, you know. Um, and in doing that, we, we spread ourselves too thinly. We said yes too many times. Uh, and in the end, then it tells them the quality because you can't possibly deliver that quality and I look at if I look at what I'd call two failure periods of sensible software failure what well, one is one was when we started to stretch ourselves so like I say cannon fodder was brilliantly executed game I'm really happy with cannon fodder um it was the first game I hadn't done the art on so I was a bit nervous about managing that so to counteract that Stu Cambridge did all the art I drew maps, gridded maps of every level and exactly how things should be laid out and how it should be done. I trusted Stu with the images, but it was more the design side of controlling the design. And, and it was a very, very controlled design. So every level, we introduced something new to the player they've not seen before. It's very systematic because it was me wanting control when I wasn't doing the art. So I went into like a producer designer mode of, you know, uber control. Um, and the result was very good. And uh, um, Jules Jameson did the programming for us, did a great job, really, really good. And then we did Canon for the two, but at the same time as we were doing Canon for the two, I was really heavily focusing on SWAS, on Sensible World of Soccer. Um, 
and I was also starting to think about sex, drugs and rock and roll in the distance, but more f focusing on SWAS. And I didn't have time to have the level of input and focus I normally would and um, suggested that we got another guy to do it. Stuart Campbell came on board with us who wrote for Amiga Power and was a good friend of ours and I knew he loved our games and, and knew, he knew our stuff and he fancied doing something new and Stuart did an okay job but he obviously wasn't experienced at the level I was or whatever and I think that we kind of although it was on the same engine so the levels are kind of the same so it kind of play the same Although it can be, some people say it's a bit hard, it's up hard. The feeling of being in a world which resonated with real world war and being in like the Vietnam War kind of feeling and the naming of the levels and these small details had moved. Now you're in an alien world and you've got these, mm. these other names and it's kind of moving a little bit away from the universe we created, you know, and, and that lost a bit in the game. That's where the game lost something in it. It wasn't a disaster, but it didn't. Where a sensible world of soccer took sensible soccer forward, Cannon for the two took Cannon for the back a step, if you know what I mean. Hmm. Uh, and that's what I always felt. So it's not a bad game. It's, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good game, actually. It's a good game, even a very good game. But it's not, it doesn't have the X factor Cannon for the has. It didn't have all those bits like the, the music and the and the and the feeling of people dying in war and the great gameplay and the every level something new is opening up and it, it just something was missing in it you know and that's my fault for letting go of it i mean i let go of it because i didn't have enough time to do everything and it's not stuart's fault because he did a pretty good job and the game did very well really but it just you can just feel that something has been lost a bit and with sensible golf it was just a question of we had Jules, who was doing Cannon for the Two, was doing sensible golf programming at the same time, using the same engine. And the Cannon for the engine was never purpose to write a golf game. We thought we could get away with it, but then quite late into the development, the, we, we realised we, there's certain things we couldn't do animation-wise with the engine we wanted to do. To We wanted a lot more humour in sensible golf. We wanted to have people taking the piss out of each other for missing shots and stuff and you know kind of like mario golf a bit more social but with a bit more of an edge um but we couldn't do these things because of technical reasons and i found i find the game very dry and almost like an uncompleted painting or something it's like there's something missing from it again it's not bad some people really love it but i find it hard to see that game and um we signed up with virgin and they paid good money for it. And I don't think we ever gave them quite the value for with that particular game. It's the only one I would say where I kind of feel that. And then, um, I, oh, apart from the three, some of the 3D stuff. <laughs> so then, so then, but at the, at the time as we were finishing that stuff up, um, and of course in there you've got Swass in the middle of this conversation, which is our greatest ever game. Hmm. Uh, and then we moved to... Um, So that Swiss was came out in 1994. And then in 1994, when that came out, and that's the game that the God Law did, that got in this canon of the 10 most influential games of all time, blah, blah, blah. So um, we were really, really worth a lot. And that's when we get to 95. And we could have sold our company then. Um, but we didn't want to. We wanted to do what we did, sign deals up with the publisher, publishers. We had... We tended to go back to the same publishers for a few games rather than just do one and then jump around. But we always tried to have a few on the go. And we've had a very successful era working with with Renegade and with Virgin and to a lesser extent with Ocean sitting in the background with WizKid. So we kind of had enough partners that, that you know, after the Mirosoft experience where we put all our eggs in one basket and then the basket fell over, we were like, we're never going to do that again. We're going to keep our keep it on that spread wide so that if one of our publishers one of our sources of income collapses at least another one is alive because we realized from the Megalorain experience how close we were to death as a company 
but then we got to a stage where we had we were basically caught in a fight between Virgin and and, and Renegade. Well, Renegade Renegade sold their company to Warner, so it now became a, a Warner thing, and we were just caught in a war. Like both, we, we said to them, right, we're going to do three games. We're going to do the next sensible soccer, but it's going to be three D. We're going to do this sex and drugs and rock and roll adventure game thing, and we're doing another game called Have a Nice Day. And they really wanted us, and they basically was a million pound a game advance. So that was another incentive for doing three. Um, and we wanted to keep it split. We wanted to keep it with Sensible Soccer with um, uh, with Warner and uh, Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll with Virgin and have a nice day with it either side. But neither of them wanted us to be able to do that. They both wanted all of us. So they, both parties would only do the deal if we did all the games with them, which was a not very nice because i had to negotiate with both sides and then we had to make a decision which one we went with because we they, they, they both stopped us from, we wanted to keep both of them but it's they, they stopped us from doing it you understand so in the end we decided to go with uh, warner and the reason we went with warner though, I think there's a couple of reasons um but the main reason we went with warner is because um most of our money was coming through Warner and the Sensible Soccer Royalty. Sensible Soccer was outselling Cannon Fuller quite a lot. And uh, we knew that whoever we didn't sign with would be pissed off with us for a while. And we, we couldn't afford to jeopardise that Sensible Soccer income, you know, because it was just continuing every year. We'd just sell, new version comes out and you get more and more money from it. So we, we, we decided to go with Warner. Um, so now we had all our eggs in one basket again. We did have still royalties coming in from Cannon Fodder and Virgin were always good at honouring that and, you know, fair play to them. Um, and, uh, and some people at Virgin, like Sean Brennan, who we loved, he was a great marketing guy, and Tim Cheney, who there was a publishing person, it was, it's really sad to let people down and have to say no. And it, the worst meeting, business meeting I ever did was going in to tell uh, Sean that we had to turn them down. Now they're offering us millions and millions and we're going, no, we don't want it. We're going to go with someone else. They must have felt terrible. Uh, yeah, so we, we, in the end we, we went with Warner and uh, then we started on making these new games. But there was a catch in these million pound advances. So our deal was brilliant. Our deal was brilliant because we basically got paid regardless of what we did. I mean, we really negotiated the perfect deal. So it was so in our favour, it was ridiculous. But the catch was we had to make games in 3D, which nowadays sounds like nothing. But in those days, we're back in 1995, and a bunch of people were still working on 3D, had started working on 3D by then. But in Sensible, we'd never touched 3D. You know, we, we were the top developer in Europe on 2D machines, on the old 16-bit machines. Between 90, June 1992, and June 1995, a three-year period, a sensible software game was number one for 52 weeks. So we were so dominant on those old machines, we had no desire to change. But the market was changing, and the reason we were getting off a big advances is because we were kind of being coerced into going 3D. We were offered like four times more money than we would have got to stay 2D. And the market was kind of dying, you know, that 2D market was dying, which is fine. But the problem we had was that we didn't have the experience internally to work on 3D. So we'd assumed a sensible, we, we'd hit this gold patch where everything we did turned to gold, everything we touched turned to gold. So we thought, oh, that's easy. We've already done the 8-bit to 16-bit transition, and that was extremely smooth and easy. It's just going to be the same. It's just like we do the same, but we get paid like four or five times more money. Brilliant. Unfortunately, it took us about a year to learn. It wasn't at all the same. <laughs> so the problem was we needed to employ more programmers and we needed to employ 3D programmers, which we'd not done before. And uh, this is very much 
Chris's realm of dealing with the programming side of the company. Obviously, I'm not a technical guy. But we didn't really have experience in in working with these people. And it was also during kind of dot-com bubble time. And what that meant was there was a lot of bullshitters out there, like overselling themselves. And we went through a number of programmers uh, on, on games, like uh, who said they could do something, but it turned out they couldn't really do it, or they were overplaying their hand. Um, particularly with Sensible Soccer 3D, my God, that was such a problem, like finding someone who could execute it to a reasonable level that was that we could say, you know, there's a, it's kind of frustrating that like Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll, for example, and Sensible Soccer, um, we had really good games and we had programmers who were woefully inadequate to do that. They're part of the job. So uh, Sensible Soccer on the on the... The management side and everything you know we had chris chapman doing he was great in controlling that and keeping it together but on the 3d side we didn't have the right programmers there to execute what was expected of a game that was the top selling football game in the world at the time you know we needed to to keep that quality going or maybe fifa was just overtaking us at that point but we were very very big and we needed quality and we couldn't find it and we didn't have the experience with you know we we kind of lucked out with programming we, we had chris yates who was like a genius then we had um chris chapman who's absolutely brilliant and did loads of our hit games then we had jules jameson who was also brilliant but it was a bit burnt out by then because he'd been off more than he could do with kind of fuller two and sensible golf and dave corn was also very good uh so apart from the experience with martin finding it a bit hard to be a lead programmer we hadn't really come across a programmer that couldn't do their job. And all of a sudden we had three of them sitting in the office at once, you know. <laughs> and and the problem with programmers, it takes you a while to suss them out. So it takes a while for it to come to the surface that, you know, sometimes programmers are not their ways and after a while you find out they're quite good. And and one of them particularly was just a, a brilliant bullshitter at telling you what he was doing and just like I said, there to take the wages to play the game, not thinking about the long-term consequences on the game itself. You know, when, when you've got games, like in Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll's case, we had 10 artists working on it. So you've got 10 artists and you've got me as a designer and you've got myself and Richard Joseph doing the sound on it and th there's a lot on that. Um, and a couple of guys making videos all the time as well. And, and then it's going through one lead programmer who's not doing the job suddenly you know it's you got this the problem with making games is that the roles are not equal your lead programmer is the king because if he messes up everyone else's game just falls to pieces like you can you can get around having a weak artist or a weak designer or you know a weak producer but a weak lead programmer everything literally technically just collapses in a heap and unfortunately, we had that happening simultaneously with with um, <clears throat> all three games. Uh, Chris was kind of struggling a bit with Have a Nice Day, which he was doing, because he hadn't done 3D before. That was on the PlayStation. And, um, and the other two games were also struggling. So the other thing we hadn't accommodated in our plan was the concept of needing middle management. So sensible software was always a very light on management place. I mean, we weren't even a limited company until 1994. We were a partnership. We, 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 the, the business was constructed like we were a band. So basically, we're in partnership together. Everyone else that comes in, they all come in as contractors. They're all on a percentage if we sell well. It's just like putting a band together, but with games. And what we learned from um, the Mirosoft experience was the need uh, it must have been a little bit after that as well, but they need to have a company. So they need to have legal protection because someone might sue you, basically, you know, and making sure that you've got personal protection when whoever knows what, for whatever reason, might sue you. I mean, we had, I'll give you an example. It was on one of the Sensible Soccer games that eventually came out in 98. <coughs> one of, our, one of the, the, the art team were doing a video, promo video for it. And someone had done someone's boot kicking the ball. And we got pointed out that's an Adidas boot with three stripes down the side. You've got to remove the three stripes so you can be sued. 
I mean, it just makes you want to like tear your hair out. It's like, uh, but that's just just the reality. You have to understand yeah. that. And when you've got some money, when you've got money, being attacked and losing your money is more not being attacked and losing your money is more important than making more money. Hmm. Like it's a, it's like being in a football match where you're one nil up, or you know, or you're one nil up with ten minutes to go. Then you just put the defence out, hmm. and the really this the way the legal world works within things like games is not very nice because you know it's at the moment we're working on a football game and you have to be so careful with all the legality of it because you make one full step and you're done and you can lose everything you put up in your life if you, if you haven't structured it properly so it makes you incredibly defensive hmm. you know i mean it you, makes you, you you had some experience as well with the uh, the poppy and cannon fodder even didn't you well the um, poppy and cannon fodder we had poppy and cannon fodder we had a, an issue with the royal british legion who told us that it was their poppy and their copyright that little plastic poppy, the, the paper is, poppy. The is that is that true? Well, yeah, apparently, oh. they made us they made us remove it from the box, and they asked us for some money because they thought we were insulting the war dead or something. I, I don't know. We we paid them five hundred quid, and I never bought a poppy since, which is a pity because I actually really respect war veterans and stuff. But I don't like companies suing us. You know, well, I think I think I just think fuck you. you know, I think of all all that. Well, yeah. I think of all the games out there that, I mean, there, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of games featuring soldiers. I mm -hmm. think, I think, if anything, um, you showed them more respect. Absolutely, we did. I mean, it's just, it, it was, it was one of those moments. Like people say, if you play heavy, if you play Black Sabbath backwards, you hear them saying, "Go and worship the devil." It's kind of like that, you know. It's like it, the Daily Star ran an article on it, and some people jumped onto it. And I think the problem was these people hadn't seen the game in context or had it explained to them or presented to them. They just heard, you know, especially back in the early 90s, we're talking about 28 years ago from now. So people, computer games were still not mainstream. And it was just like some, those young people and their stuff and not respecting us and the cheek of it, what do they think they're doing? Instead of looking at the context in which we put it, um, I understand why they didn't bother with that because they probably didn't play computer games at all. They just heard the story and went with it. But uh, I mean, I think that we also had a problem with the Captain Sensible music in Sensible Soccer, the original one. Um, we we met up with Captain Captain Sensible got in touch with us and said, "You're called Sensible and I'm called Sensible. And I want to do a piece of music for you." And we went, "Okay, that's cool. You know, you're Captain Sensible, great." from the damned um but the problem was he didn't tell us something he said he'd do it for a pint of beer we bought him a pint of beer great you know i gave him a one-page contract which he didn't sign i thought oh he's a punk whatever anyway sensible soccer came out did very well three months later we got a letter from a music publishing company saying we are captain sensible's music publishers and we own all his music and you're using his music on your game and we want 10 percent of your income we're like, well, for a start, the music's not worth 10% of the income. Like, uh, we would pay our music guy 4% for all the music and all the sound of the game, of the money we got, not the money the publisher got, but after all, that's come off then, of our cut, we'd pay 4% to, to Richard Joseph. Um, across, as it turned out, all of our games, because he did the sound for all of our games once Martin had gone. Um, but we're like, in the end, we had to pay them £10,000 to make them go away. And you, the, the problem with, the, problem with the, the system of how this stuff works is that if you're making a football game with, in, in Sensible World of Soccer's case, 1,500 teams, 27,000 players, imagine if all of them are trying to sue you for 10% each. <laughs> Right. There's no, there's no sense in this stuff. It's not like the easiest thing would be to do to say there's a ceiling on how much people can claim for someone else's product, and that ceiling is, I don't know, thirty percent. If it went through court, it'd be thirty percent. 
split between all the suing parties. So if like all 25,000 players wanted to come afterwards, they're going to get their fraction of that 30% combined with the clubs and whatever else. Then as a creator, you can go around and feel safe because you know you might have to pay out royalties to people, which is fair enough if you're exploiting their IP. But you also know that there's a level where it's not going to be insane. And there's no law at all protecting us at all in this at the moment. There's no, there's no, the law is deliberately there so that some people can attack you if they feel like it. Just to make you feel uncomfortable, you know? Mm. And it makes you, after a while of working in that, it makes you very negative, you know? It makes you think in a very negative headset. Like, sometimes you'll read people in football games, why, why haven't they got the real names in the game? It's because it costs over a million quid to get the real names in the game. That's why, hmm. you know, I mean, it's not free and it doesn't last forever. And there's massive limitations on what you can do with it. And it just, it's hard for maybe for people to understand how that works. But when you, one thing I dislike about, about game making is we're treated in a very unfair position comp compared to say, if you've got a website about football, you're using footballers' names, logos, club names, mm -hmm. and photographs every day. And no one is going to read, I don't know, what, whatever website writes. You know, imagine if you're reading, I don't know, The Guardian or The Times or The Sun or The Daily Mail or The Express or whatever, their football page. But all the names are messed up and all the letters are jumbled on the team names. And Manchester United are called Manchester Reds. And Arsenal are called Ashburton Grove. And there's no real logos. No one's going to read it, right? Mm -hmm. But these guys don't have the same limitation as we do on using this stuff, even though they're displaying those words on the same screen. And I just do not understand. I've never understood the law on it. I think that at the point that games were starting to be made, people saw them like film. And they thought it's like putting it in a film and having, you know, I don't know, someone running around going, you know, I, I'm, I don't know, Neymar or whatever, you know. And not understanding that on a computer level, like you can spit out 27,000 names in a game and it's nothing. Hmm. Just, you know, it's just data. It's just a few bytes of stuff. And, and it's not really, in my opinion, it's not exploitation. It's just accurately recreating a real world which happens to have these things in it, like you'd use a country name or, a, or whatever. So I think it would, I hope in the future, not just for sports games, sports games particularly, you have to think about this. I mean, like we're making social soccer now and we really have to think about it. You know, we have a, the license on the Chinese Super League so we can use these guys in the game and in the marketing, but every season we have to change who's on the box and be careful about images we're using. It. It's like a, and that's with a license. Without a license, it's like you've got to make sure that everything's – and you've got to kind of guess. You know, Like if we change the, 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 the name or a badge, how much do we need to change it? And you're kind of guessing, you know. And you'll go to a lawyer and you'll pay for lawyers and they'll all give you different advice. I guess it's, a, it's really complex, this world. So you have to think like that. And that kind of – I think a sensible software, we hit this point where – we just started to see all the negatives instead of the positives in the end as well. You know, like we had problems with programs not in 3D. We had those things that we were aware of. We had sex, drugs and rock and roll, which was 18 plus game, which people said, you can't do that. And you might be offending people. My God, we would be now for certain. So, uh, so you start to just think about, I need to protect my money and my family. You know, that comes first in the end, you know, because you start to feel the threat from outside. And in the case of sensible software, me and Chris had personally kind of underwritten the deal for this three million. And so it got really, really serious. We were like, A, we want out. In the end, it's like, we want out of this. We need to get out in one piece. You know, that becomes your priority. And then, and you know, not in a way that, that would dishonor sensible software not in a way that we would you know we 
we needed to get out, but also honour what we'd done. We'd always paid our guys well. We'd always looked after everybody. We'd always honoured our contracts to our publishers. So we needed to do both. We needed to play a very, very, very careful, clever strategy game at the end of Sensible Software. And so by the end, we were like just relieved to get out in one mm. piece and not lose our money and not lose our reputation and not piss anyone off. It was really, really hard. And it's it's kind of, when you look at companies from the outside now, what it teaches you is you don't really know what people are going through. You know, from an outside perspective, you can look at something, but until you've been in that position where, you know, you're going to bed with palpitations every night thinking, you know, I've got to make the right decision all the time. Um, it makes you think in a certain headset and a certain way but in a way, it helps you to grow up and understand how business is working and how these things work. And now, for example, we're working with Sociable Soccer now. And, you know, we're being very careful with that. And it's been five years in development and we are doing everything we can to make sure that, you know, with the football stuff, we understand we've now got some rights and not other rights. And we're talking to people about maybe getting some rights. And uh, But you've got to make sure that in all cases, you're dealing fairly with people and and you're honoring the from the point of view of the clubs and the footballers out there you you've got to try and play the game and, and understand that you don't exploit them where you try not but yeah it's uh it, it was easier in those old days when mm. before you had the big business in before you had the that that headset of legality in um it was easier and now it's become it's kind of two markets it's like almost if your game gets too big then you're in the firing line you know so it's finding that that balance where it's all right you know and i hope that we can move forward as an industry uh in the not too distant future that we can have a discussion about how we can allow developers to more comfortably move forward and they're not worried about has this boot got an adidas stripe on the side of it um i saw a i saw a video one of random facebook video of i think it was the beastie boys or what's that other american boy band that's quite big new kids on the block oh, Sing, yeah. right and one of them had what suspiciously looked suspiciously like an Adidas logo on his shirt, but it was all blurred out. Like they, they blurred it out so you can't couldn't see it. Although you could tell it was an Adidas logo, it was just blurred out enough that you couldn't prove it was. And you know, I watched these, I watched these um, uh. A lot of guitar there's, there's this, this guy that does this great stuff about going through the best rock solos and the best whatever you know the best tracks of this uh he's very very good an american guy and um but sometimes he's got to just like not play the music or play a snippet with it or you know having been someone who's owned important rights in things for 30 odd years there's ways to deal with this that are decent like if someone comes to me and says can we use your track on a video i will normally go okay you know the, the kind of feeling of it if, it if it's made and it's not made to, to 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 make money and deliberately exploit it great if you want to make some money out of it then just let's come to some kind of an agreement the only time i've slapped people down is twice was <clears throat> was to do with the use of the cannon fodder song the narcissus song or war where someone directly put it on the their thing to like give the impression that it was being endorsed oh uh in one case in uh something to do with the canon for the three game which came out which right. i had nothing to do with hmm. and and in that case i said no you can't use the game because then it infers that there's some affiliation yeah of that yeah with that and you know it's not about the money and in that case it's like no nothing to do with this game don't don't mm. don't, don't make the affiliation more of an artistic thing if you like because we're in um, touch on that actually you you wrote that didn't you when you were uh what 15 uh narcissus and then that became I was, the... I was 18 yeah when I was oh, 18 sorry yeah 
That's all right. And then that, that, became, that became the theme for uh, Cannon Fodder, obviously. Uh, yeah, well, it was like yeah. the. Uh, it wasn't a theme actually, was it? It was like the uh, with the soldiers. It's the, the one. It's the one with. It's the one with the soldiers queuing up and the and the medals going up. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So it's a uh, sensible software was uh, was a very special time. You know, we were so lucky. We we two thirds of our games were number one hits. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We made some great stuff. Artistically, it's made my life since I was in my twenties. It's given me enough money to comfortably look after my family, to have a lot of fun, to go around. You know, I'm not super rich, but I've always been I've been pretty rich since I was like 27, and I'm now 55. So, you know, I mean, I can't complain. It's great. So, you know, it, it's given me a lot of a lot of stuff, and I think that the time we had before we made money was just as important because you. You appreciate it. You you appreciate. You don't just land on it. It's like you work a bit hard and you build your reputation up, and then you land on something. And then, even for me, between periods like after that, then I worked for Codemasters for three years, which was a lot of fun when we sold our company to Codemasters. And then, since then, then I did some consulting, really weird consulting and some really weird games, in in a terrible time to sell original games in like the late nineties and early two thousands, and had a lot of fun working with people. Didn't make a lot of money really go much with it and then we set up tail studios in 2004 with mike montgomery and john phillips and the bitmap brothers i set that up that was fun we did mobile versions of sensible soccer and counterfoot that did well and then um i did a whole bunch of consulting for different companies in different countries so i've been in in the ukraine i've been in turkey and in in poland and currently I'm in Finland working with Combat Breaker on Social Soccer, which has been great. That's been five years. And that's actually going really well. So with Social Soccer, we're, it's cross-platform, but at the moment it's only out on Apple Arcade. And so we are just working on all the other platforms and building features in. And it's been it's been a longer road than, than we'd have all wanted to get where we are. I mean, we all think that we could have gone faster. We could have done this in what we've done so far in three years, not five. But for, for different reasons, it's gone a bit slower than we wanted. But it's fun, you know, and uh, it's good to be making a decent football game again. Uh, and, and in a way, it's nice to, well, that's frustrating for everyone else that it's only on Apple Arcade and most people haven't got it. For us, it's good because it means we can iron out the creases in the game on, on Apple Arcade before we put it on the other platforms. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is watching this and wondering where the hell is your game on these platforms you promised five years ago, um, it's been a weird route. If, if you don't mind speaking about this for a while. So uh, we started off planning the game for PlayStation, Xbox, and PC on a Kickstarter. <clears throat> we kind of rushed the Kickstarter out very much because we kind of all met each other and said, I'd wanted to do a football game for ages. So when I found this team, it was like, yeah, let's just go for it. And we, we decided to go for it. It was just before Christmas. And we were kind of warned, this is a bit crazy, but we were like, fuck it, we're going to do it anyway. And we didn't, we set a bar at 300,000 pounds which is quite high uh for a kickstarter but quite low for a development for a football game on those three platforms so it's kind of like a weird thing and anyway to cut a long story short we knew we'd failed after the first four or five days because we didn't have enough percentage of the money in so we kind of cut it short and um and then we just kept on working, making the game and during that time we were making the game and we did a vr version which we demoed in uh, london science museum a couple of times which was actually really really good um and we we were like doing all the platforms at once and we were doing business to wait to see which one we'd get any traction on because as a team we we went we went three and a half years before we got any money on the game so by that point you're just gonna you're gonna land where the money is like whoever pays us first we're gonna do their platform first you know because that's what we needed to keep going and we got a deal from a, a mobile company in china so that's great we'll do them so then you know we had mobile pc pc then gravitates into the console versions but mobile and pc were our two main platforms so we're like okay we'll do we'll focus on the mobile first then so we focused on mobile in china which is very free to play stuff so you need to build in the free to play mechanics for china and then <laughs> about a year later uh, a conversation i'd been having with um I mean, to give you an idea, I've been speaking to hundred, nearly a hundred companies about this game over the last five years. 
So you keep all these conversations spinning around with everybody, waiting to what you've got fits what they need for their company. That's how this game works. And this is for people from all the different platforms. So these guys, um, Rogue, uh, well, actually, the, at that time, they weren't still Rogue. So these guys, that I, these American guys that I'd known for about a year and a half before that point, said, we'd like to meet up with you in GDC again. Um, we remember your football game from last year and maybe, you know, maybe there's a discussion to be had. And I went there, showed them social soccer. It was on an iPad at the time um, with a couple of game controllers, like these kind of things, which you can use with it. And uh, and they're like, yeah, this is this is great. And basically, they knew what was happening with Apple Arcade. So they said, we think your game is going to be a good fit for this platform. Uh, they're like, oh, great. I mean, mobile is what we were focused on. And Apple Arcade is mostly mobile, but it's also Mac and Apple TV. So you do need to have the other side covered as well. Um, and yeah, so we we managed to get actually a very good deal with Apple. We're very happy with that. Um, which just meant that for a while, we had to focus on the mobile side, um, not do Android, because that's what happens when you work with Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, fair enough. They pay for that. So and um and hold off on the console and pc for a bit of a while but what we've done now from for the best part of nine months now we've been developing not just the mobile and the pc but also the consoles so the switch the xbox the playstation so they're now being developed uh, social soccer 2020 came out in july i think um and now we're going to put out Social Soccer 21 relatively soon. Well, we'll finish it quite soon. When it comes out, it's up to Apple. There's always a big delay, and we're never quite sure. So let's hope. <laughs> the last one was quite a long time going through the process of getting, going through the approvals. Right. Um, and then uh, we should, fingers crossed, by the year, Towards the end of this year, we should be ready with the, some of the other platforms. But at the same time, we we were always talking to different publishers, and it, what we've been doing with this game is waiting for the right deal to fall in place before we move. So, um, of course, we can self-publish, but my experience is that I've worked with great publishers in my life. I've worked with Ocean, I worked with Renegade, I worked with Virgin, I worked with Palace. Um, BT Software, and then um, you know a whole bunch of other different publishers. Codemasters, of course, I worked for Jagex at the time. I know what value a, a good publisher can give to a game. And although, as Tower, we have self-published Speedball to Evolution, which was a modern version of Speedball on mobile, and we did actually get to number one on that game. And then my work, my game works well. Got to number two on a platform with a all right but that wasn't self-published anyway actually but i'm not a publisher and i would rather us work with a publishing partner having said that we can self-publish and as the game gets better and the momentum gets more and we build the relationships with nintendo and microsoft and sony more that becomes a possibility and steam of course as well so and we have had the Steam version now. So the Steam version came out in 2017 um, of Social Soccer. Uh, that was okay. It was kind of a demo of what we were doing, really. Um, the current version is vastly superior to that. And yeah, we, it wasn't it wasn't massively followed. So we kind of like we pulled that away for a while um, before the Apple Arcade came out. But yeah, so we're we're in a position now where we are. We uh, have been called by Pocket Gamer the best arcade football game on mobile, which is wow. great. Um, and um, we have been a number one game in Apple Arcade. We were last December when the game came out, just shortly after the game came out. And we're, you know, we're slowly developing what we're doing with our game and making it a better and better and better game. Um, it's weird because we're in Apple Arcade. So Apple Arcade is totally to the side of normal mobile. And 80% of the people who, who use it are American. It's a US thing. So 
it's kind of quite strange that we've made as a as as a as a person associated with making football games like sensible soccer or micro soccer where the main audience is in europe number one and number two probably more console pc oriented to suddenly find that the games coming out in the states on mobile through the apple arcade system is, is a little bit of a departure you know and and the one after that's going to be in china you know mm -hmm. so these are different kind of markets but the way the games industry works is you need to be able to do that to move with the market to make sure your business works you know as, as i've mentioned in this story every so many years things change and they move and you can't control them like you just have to adapt we had to adapt to my to Mirosoft going down we had to adapt to being forced to move to 3d we had to adapt to a near disaster in our in our contract with warner um and each time you just change and then you go again or like when we set tower studios up and we're working in those funny little nokia phones and stuff um you know and then suddenly you switch to touchscreen phones and then for a while everyone's going yeah angry birds it's great we can do that and then you know at that time there was only one and a half thousand mobile games out now there's like one and a half million out you know so then you've got this whole other thing about how do we fight the marketing and it's like well that's the great thing about apple arcade there's only 150 games on it so getting discovered on apple arcade isn't hard the slight downside for us is that the main audience is in america and they simply don't like football <laughs> so for, for us you've got that that flip side it's like that you know that we know that the majority of apple arcade users are not going to resonate very well with the soccer title um having said that it's doing really well it's it's like it's it's incredibly stable i mean our user base is incredibly stable it just keeps every week we're getting reports in and it's doing really well and i'm you know i'm delighted with it i mean in terms of how the game's performing on a, on a relatively small platform it's great so we're hoping once it pushes out to the other platforms we get the you know that big push that that, that we're used to having i'm used to having mm. success with this stuff you know mm. but at, at the same time i'm used to having period fallow periods and this is this is the most successful game i've made in 20 years so mm. I'm, I'm really happy about it so until it comes out on the other systems if people don't have apple arcade or in europe or, or whatever the case uh, is there like a website where they can follow the progress yeah if you go to if you if you go to our facebook page so sociable soccer on facebook or you can go to Twitter. Um, they're probably the two, the two ones that, you know, that the, the easiest ones to follow. Um, you can look at the Apple Arcade page if you want. Um, but yeah, they're the places to go. And you know, we've got a, we've got, we're building a, a community of people playing the game at the moment, which is which is mm. which is good. Um, and yeah, watch this space. I mean, the other platforms will come out when they're ready. Uh, but we all want them out because we've been working this in five years it's a long time to work on a game and all of us in the team are like we just want it out we want it done but at the same time we want to we want it to come out when it's ready to to be to, to come out so yeah i think with a bit of a fair wind later this year will be the time although i said that the previous year so <laughs> there you go Never mind. So anyway, what's the questions? Uh, questions. So uh, one of them was um, uh, Richard Joseph doing the sound and, and the music and everything that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so who did the voices for uh, the, the really funny uh, voice samples for Megalomania? <laughs> OK, so Richard is a very, very dear friend of mine, was a very, very dear friend of mine. Of course, he, he died some years ago now, you know, about 15 years ago almost. But um. Uh, when we did Megalomania, he used a guy called Mike Burdett, who also sometimes goes under the name of Jams O'Connell. I think it's a pseudonym, but he did the voices for Megalomania. Wow, so it's all one person. Yeah. Uh, no, the woman might have been. Oh, yeah. Right? Why not? That one. <laughs> um i don't know who did that that was a woman who did that i don't know which woman um but yeah uh, i think he did the the voices and um i think he also did one of the tunes he did the the phasey like uh, the menu tune with the phasey strings 
I like that tune. It's very, uh, very sinister and atmospheric. You know, I remember when we were when we were finishing Megalomania and we were doing loads and loads and loads of testing, which is when we started to make sense of soccer during this phase of just waiting two hours for the game to build and messing around with sensible soccer graphics in the background, turning them into little megalomania when the football gets on. Um, we'd have like three or four computers booting up megalomania at the same time. And you've probably not done this, but if you boot the megalomania music up on several machines at once and play it all at the same time, that it really phases in and out of each other. It sounds amazing. It's very, it's very odd, odd sound, but I, I recommend, I recommend it to anyone who's, once to get the full experience of being in the sensible software office. Preferably you sleep deprive yourself for a week, right? And then you start super duper late and then put it on like about four in the morning with all these machines going and see how, how you feel. And that's how we were feeling. Okay. I'll, I'll do that in my first <laughs> convenience. <laughs> you need multiple, multiple copies of Megalomania, multiple Amigas. Oh, well, I mean, we've got one Amiga. We, we've got a Mega Drive and we've got the PC. I'm sure oh, we, we can do, do it. at least a few of them on the go. Yeah. Get it to phase. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, so, um, you know, at the tail end, struggling with 3D in the three games, mm -hmm. and then uh, I believe Warner were bought by, G was it GT Interactive? And then, by GT Interactive, that's correct, yeah. And then obviously, you'll get out of jail free card. You you know, you made the one game out of the three, and happy days, mm -hmm. you don't have to do the other two. But the, um, can you, br like, briefly, Tell me uh, about um, have a nice day. Was it? And, have a nice uh, day. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, I can. So, me and Chris had this uh, joke game that we've been talking about for years, which was Office Chair Massacre. Uh, and the, the premise of the game was simple. I mean, I think we first had this idea in when we moved into our office in March that we did. It would have been about nineteen ninety one. Maybe we had this idea. And basically the idea was that you, you're sitting in, a, in, a, in an office chair with wheels on the bottom that spin around and with arms. Right? That's important. That's the office chair. And then strapped to the arms are these two guns. And as you fire the guns, it pushes you backwards with the recoil, but you also shoot forwards. That's the starting point of the idea, right? So you've got this jet propulsion on the guns firing forwards to push you backwards and you're spinning around. And then, and actually I noticed last year, I think someone's actually made a game where you do this as a movement mechanic. So it's actually been published many, many years later. We're talking about God knows how many years later. 30 years later it comes out or something. Anyway, but, but there's a really good off, office politics parody, so I can explain it to you. So basically, a bit like Megalomania, you've got four factions, red, green, yellow, and blue. And they represent four guys who are the vice president of whatever, vying with each other to become the president of whatever, or the senior vice president. So in order to get promotion in their company, they have to outdo the, their rivals in terms of how many sales they get or what the bottom line is, you know. And the way they do this is by within their office that they it's all set in an office with different rooms, you know, like different rooms in an office. So they'll they'll fire themselves around this place. Obviously, they're trying to shoot the other guys with their enemies, but they're also entering rooms of I don't know a sales team. And then they basically got to terrorize the sales team into working for them instead of the other guy. So they go into the sales team and then they. They like maybe shoot someone or whatever, and then the rest start working for you. Okay, and then once you've got control of them, saving the sales office, you go right. You two, I want you two to just be doing as many sales as you can, and the third guy, you're just going to be guarding the door, and as soon as anyone comes in, you're going to you're going to shoot at them. So you're kind of like managing your troops within the office. And then after X amount of time, you've got a sales target and whoever of the three, the four managers hits the sales target wins the level and you get the promotion. So this was set around the States. You had like an office in Houston, another one in New, New York and another one, Chicago, whatever. I can't remember all the cities now. Um, and so the, the next, the next um, 
office, you go up a level. So now you've got sales, but you've also got um, a buying team. So you've got a buying team and a selling team. So you've got the buying team to buy the product in so the sales team can sell it out. So now you're going to manage two different sorts of worker for you with this same coloured faction thing. So it's slightly more complex, you know, like the red guy might be dominating the buying, but your guy is yellow, he's dominating the selling and, you know, this kind of stuff. I can't remember if you could do allegiances with people and then break them like Megalomania. I can't remember that, that part of it. Anyway, then the next part, the next level apart from that, you've got a, you've got a, I think it was a, a marketing team. So the marketing team, then they push the sales. Then you've got a legal team, which tries to get money in by suing people. And then you've got an accounts team, which tries to fill the, the way it's going through. So you end up with this just office. It's an office politics, politics parody, basically, based, in, based on ter terrorization and guns and fun. Excellent. Thanks for that explanation. Yeah. Um, Sadly, never happened. Our dream of office chair massacre turned into a 3D nightmare, like all the games in those days did. Pretty, it's quite fun. It, it's funny how uh, 3D was regarded at the time, as opposed to how it's regarded now. Because obviously, that you know, 2D games have aged so much better than a lot of the games from the late 90s have in th that were 3D. Uh, uh, if you look at the the 3D, the the problem is, I mean, the blessing of things like Unity and Unreal at the moment. Uh, they're amazing from a game developer's perspective, especially as a designer, I have to say. Like, the worst period of game development was that period. And it was like, it, the reason was that pretty simple as this. In that whole period preceding the 3D, like the whole 8-bit and 16-bit period, if you had to say how we divided our time in terms of game making in the office, roughly 25% of the time was spent managing the machine side in other words making sure it was technically everything was running properly managing the way that you're using the memory and stuff like that and the way you're displaying graphics on the screen all those kind of things which was important on the Commodore 64 and, and the Amiga it, it was absolutely critical on the Commodore 64 so but it meant that 75 percent of the time we could spend on crafting the game making a great game as soon as we moved to that early 3d it totally flipped around 75% of the time was spent just making the graphics appear on the screen. Like, I remember the first year and a bit of sensible soccer. We couldn't, there wasn't a game. There weren't footballers, there weren't graphics, there were not players. So you go from a game which is where you're spending most time really refining and making the game great to just making the graphics appear so you can even start to think about putting a game in there. Gameplay was done 25% of the time. That's the that was the big minus, and you know that is why these graphic engines now that work across multiple platforms are such a blessing because that problem has gone away. Mm. Um, the the big problems now we have is that the are different. So the now problems are slightly different because then the route to market was very simple. You sold a game in a box for. 20 quid or whatever. Nowadays, you've got free to play, you've got subscription, you've got um, uh, premium games, you've got Facebook going into it, you've got online play. So you've got all these SDKs and, and you've got data privacy, which is a new one which is coming, which is a bit of a nightmare. So nowadays, the complexity is coming from different areas. It's, it's all this outer world you're connecting with um and the infinite complexities of how that works and then you've got platform holders who fight with each other sometimes so you know when you've got a unity game you can make every platform play against every other platform online easy to do but you then you've got to get the platform holders to agree that yes they can they can buy their game on our machine x account and play against machine y even though the machine y Manufacturers might be making more money at them because they own the account on that machine. So you were you you're wandering into different complexities, or you know I don't know. Um, or social soccer is a good example. So you got a game which um, simultaneously leads to run on certain phones, and yet at the same time you're looking at 
a, a you know, high-end new next-gen Xboxes. And it's like, at what point do we split our graphics and branch it out? And what, how do we manage these things up and down, you know? So you get half the solution with the Unity, but not all of it, because there's practical differences. And the, the in my opinion, I, this is something I've been pushing for many years now. But the, I think it's very detrimental to, to not make platform holders conform in certain ways. So I think this is driven through American patent law, where in order to make money, you say, this is mine, it's my property, and you can't go against this property. And if you do, I will sue you or push you away or you claim a space. But what that's meant is that you've got examples like um, where uh, Flash just wouldn't work at all on... I think, was it was it an Apple device or was it? I, don't, I think it was. I can't remember. It might have been Apple. Or it might have been Microsoft. Anyway, it just didn't work because it was deliberately made so it couldn't work. Yeah. Or you've got like a lead that you use for charging up your even charging up your phone, but it doesn't charge up another phone you buy. So now you you've got you 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 hit ecological problems as well as efficiency problems. Like you have got a landfill full of charging wires for phones that. You could have used the same one for 20 years if they were the same bloody shape input on the side. You know, if they didn't deliberately yeah. make it different for the hell of it. And the same happens with computer games. You get things which don't work because they're not compatible because they didn't work together to set standards. Mm. So I've had a long and frankly losing crusade on this, but I will continue <laughs> with this. So like, if you look at the car world, it's a really good example of where it works well. So, Car manufacturers um, compete with each other, but the standards that they're working to are the same. They're the same gauge cars working on the same size roads with the same three or four types of fuel, you know, with the same safety standards, with the same rough speed limitations. So in terms of the way that they go in and out of each other on a road, the roads are standardized pretty much. You know, um, the fuels are standard, so you can refuel wherever you want. The safety standards are the same. So in terms of police, that helps pretty much internationally. And so because they're set standards, they can coordinate and interact with each other on roads and work and flow. Um, <clears throat> and that's set by having international standards that are pretty much enforced on car manufacturers. Like you must put seatbelts in your car. This is no longer an option. No, we we are we are. If you do not do that, you cannot release that thing as a commercial product. We don't have the same limitations on games companies. Like, you must make sure that your computer is compatible with all of these printers, and it never ever doesn't work with all the printers. And then you say to all the printer companies, your printers must be compatible with all these computers. And you say you've got three years to sort this out. And if you don't, your product must be withdrawn from the international market. That's how you sort this stuff out. So I'm always irritated by the lack of um, protocols forcing this software to work together. And the, the way it affects us as game makers is this. When you've made Megalomania and Cannon Fodder and Sensible Soccer and Whizball and all these games that people say, yeah, they're great classic games, no one buys them today. Why? Because the machines don't work with the new machines. Mm -hmm. So what you get is endless replications of the same thing, which is totally meaningless. Like just going back and rebuilding it again, you know, like why did we make social soccer? Because people wanted sensible soccer. You could play it online in a certain way, but with modern stuff like, so it does work on a touch screen or it does work, you know, with um, card collection or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but once we do, once we finish this work, there should be no need to redo that basic step. I mean, it's okay if you take Bejeweled and you turn it into Candy Crush. Candy Crush is a great game. It's really taken an idea and it's made it much better and embellished it. And of all those match three games, in my opinion, it's the, the best one. And there's certainly no need to do endless inferior uh, match three games so mm -hmm. you know the, the the view on the market now 
it's very different to how it was. You've got a lot of people wanting to do Me Too gaming. Like, I want a piece of the action. I want to make games. Well, that's great. You know what? I love writing music and I love playing football. And I'm not a bad musician. And some people come to my, you know, we do gigs internationally in Poland or whatever. You know, not bad. Football, worse, you know. But I don't expect to really get paid for this stuff because I'm not up to scratch. But suddenly in digital media, everyone can be an anything which is fine if you understand you're not a professional or anything hmm. but unfortunately so many people can make a little bit of money out of doing a bad replication of a this game or that game or the other game and making really good games takes a lot of times and even the good people we fail sometimes experienced people and of course sometimes new people a percentage of them are really great and break through and do a great job but there's only two game two types of games worth making number one a brand new idea no one's done before. Number two, a better version of an idea someone already did before. Hmm. Or maybe number three, a new platform of it. But that's it. Everything else is just a waste of time. So I think that platform holders not working together means that you get the same old stuff regurgitated each time on a new machine. When it's not really offering anything more than... It, it's only good because the old version didn't work on the new machine. Hmm. So yeah, sometimes you see like you know three four generations of consoles in a row and just the same game just remade with very slightly different graphics but exactly the same game it's so boring i mean it's artistically it's mind-numbingly boring like when i look back at sensible we just went okay we're going to do parallax then whizball then shoot up and traction kit then micro soccer then 3d tennis then megalomania then sensible soccer then whiskey then cannon fodder then swass then sensible golf you know you're just jumping all over the place and you're not having to go back and remaking the thing each time and yeah it would have made more money that way but it'd have been a lot more boring artistically mm. and when you compare it to other platforms films books music they don't have to redo their stuff you're still watching films that are made in the 1930s yeah, although I think that culture is bleeding into films now. The last few years, there's a lot of unnecessary remakes coming out. There's a lot of unnecessary remakes, but the bigger point here is that you can watch a film made in the 1930s running on your telly you bought yesterday. That's true. And you cannot do that with a game. No, you, and you need the old uh, CRT and the, you know the old tech and everything. And you can read a book that was written back in. Uh, BC, if so, if there are any if such books exist, but certainly you can read a book that was written in, you know, that's printed off on Thomas Caxton's printing press. If you can read Latin or whatever it was written in, you mm -hmm. can read it now. Music, you can replicate music from any era now. Now, what that means as an artist is that your back catalogue always continues to sell. In our world, the technology kills off our back catalogue. Mm. Yeah. Mad, isn't it? it it's mad than in. It's not mm. just mad. So you look at something like Sensible Soccer, it was pirated 20 to 1 when it came out, and now it can't even be produced. So this is, as an artist, incredibly inefficient. So it's kind of fodder, not on GOG or anything like that. Um, I suppose they only do piece, they, do, they only do like DOS it games. Maybe. It, 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 I don't really know. I mean, it might be. I don't know. I don't really know, but 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 the the point is that you the, there's there's been this from the hardware companies and particularly from the, the mobile companies. There's been this attitude that software is dispensable. Even back in the early mobile times, developers are entirely interchangeable, dispensable, worth nothing. They're just like grunts in a factory, hmm. and this means that it's great that our work is valued um by people like yourself but many other people that's great but on a commercial level on an artistic level that's good that's good enough for someone like me certainly it's more than i ever expected in my wild dreams at the start but from a commercial level it doesn't make sense you know we are constantly having to remake stuff because it, our stuff is being made redundant against our wishes you know whereas with a bit of technology and forward planning you could make sure that a all the platforms work with each other and not against each other like car manufacturers and b that there's built-in backwards compatibility 
that you enable simpler, older stuff to run on these new machines because the format it's done in is a way that that will operate and function in some way. That way, instead of developers focusing their energy and replicating something that's already been done 20 times over, you know, every couple of years, they could spend five or 10 years making some great new innovation that makes you go, wow. Like the first time we saw good 3D in my world, and it was Mario 64 when it came out. And you went, oh my God, that's really amazing. That's that's it, you know. That comes from five years, 10 years, focusing on something, not replicating old shit at all, like really going for it. But in this kind of market, with this kind of instability of business, you know, a good example is social soccer. We've made it without a clue how it's going to come out. Like, you know, in my, my previous game, Word Explorer, free to play games didn't even exist when I started making it. By the end, it was the only thing people were selling. So we had to actually, you know, fit free to play, like kind of jam it in to the game. And I must say we didn't do it very well, but, but it's kind of difficult to make brilliant product when the, the world you're working in is, is, is moving so fast and so unstable. Uh, and I, I, I think that there's an awful lot more we can do with entertainment software that we're doing at the moment. So <clears throat> it's got better. I mean, in the last 10 years, we've had a real glut of young developers doing stuff. And there is a lot of Me Too rubbish, but there's also quite a number of very, very talented new developers out there. It would just be nice for me if the noise of the rubbish went away so mm. we could start to as we had a sensible software a really nice you know in those days there weren't so many developers around we had a really great time to shine as a developer we had 13 year run but five or six years in the middle were really amazing um it would be nice if every developer can have that but that's going to happen by the stage being cleared by the noise you know and then and then just let those people be there. So hopefully we'll move back to that. Who knows? Maybe, maybe that's not possible. Maybe it depends on the demand of the market. You know, we're still in reality TV world <clears> at the moment <throat> when everyone wants a piece of everything. I do believe that will pass, and people will start to clamour for the concept of great art or something great or something to now that you know that that has enough gravitas that everyone follows it at the moment. We're in this fractured world where what matters is getting your face on Instagram for four seconds, um, which is a million miles away from the old way people got famous when they actually were a brilliant artist for 20 years before they even got famous. Mm. So I think we will get back there because I think people will grow tired of this stuff, but it's not going to happen quick. No, Let's see. no. I mean, there's good, I, I, there's good things about this sort of indie scene, but it is uh, very busy. Um, isn't it yeah the, the problem with it is it's too equalizing in the sense that if you put a game out on the general app store or google play you know it doesn't matter if you're if you've spent a lot of money and a lot of time with a very professional studio making the next amazing thing or if you're a kid that's knocked out in your bedroom in 10 minutes is your first ever thing you've done it goes through the same channels, the same process, and it, and it clogs up the same list of games. Yeah, that just doesn't happen in most places. Like it's it's the problem of we live in a digital world now, where we haven't got to grasp with how to curate vast amounts of stuff because no art gallery would put every picture that they were ever offered up in their on the walls. No library would put, keep every book there just because it exists. No shop would stock every physical game in a box, you know, mm -hmm. they allocate shelf space proportionately. The only way that you allocate space proportionally now is by marketing, which means you spend marketing budget, which means the marketing companies win. But the way to do it properly, in my opinion, is to, is to kind of almost like tier the games. So if you, the chances are that the, the big budget games and the big companies are more more likely than not going to be the better quality of games, right? More likely than not. Um, but they might lack, lack a bit of inspiration because normally the more money goes into a game, the safer the content is and mm. you get your sequels and stuff. So you're going to have mid-level games 
and which some of those who are by proven competent developers that maybe aren't that triple a thing the proportion of those might might have the quality to jump up to the next rank and then underneath that you've just got everything else of which a few might come through um but the the as i say it's, it's to do with these platform holders particularly the mobile platform holders having so little respect for developers they don't understand the difference in quality between them we're all just the same you just make content that goes through our pipeline and you can see it on spotify it's not just games it's, it's everything at the moment the lack of respect for artists is so disgusting like, like, like you you can you can say that it's great because it frees the market up and everyone can do it well that is great but it's disrespectful to say that this artist here is on the same shelf space as bob dylan for example i mean it's so disrespectful to a proven great artist and i don't even particularly like bob dylan but he's proven he a great great artist right so and i think as humans we're used to consuming art music books films games whatever liking the fact there's classics and we can hang our hat on them and we feel like there's you know there's there's this thing and we know it's quality and we know it's above everything else and i think at the moment the world is there's there's a huge amount of people that just want their three minutes of fame or whatever at the moment and and maybe they're not considering that 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 you make money by telling people they're great basically so all these platforms are saying yeah you're great yeah we're all equal yeah we're great everyone can be this everyone can do that everyone should have a chance but the truth is there's not how the world really works i mean if you're talking about becoming a great uh, sprinter right you've got to you've got to beat a usain bolts to get there and that's not easy like nearly everybody fails like yeah. everybody did fail so you can create this false world where everyone's equal but the reality is art has never been about art has never been democratic hmm. art says that is special why i don't know but it is and that relatively is shit or boring or you know yeah. inconsequential and you can't try and force this idea that everyone should have a chance just because it's fashionable at the moment because for whatever reason i can tell you in my life there's three things i do i make games i play music and i play football they're pretty consistent for whatever reason i'm very good at making games i've become good at it i know i'm a good designer i was a good enough artist to get the message across then i can do business pretty well in games as well i'm good at it i've proven it enough times i shouldn't have to go back and and tell people even though sometimes i do with some people you know with music i'm actually a pretty good musician i'm a pretty good songwriter i'm an okay singer but i'm not professional level even though some people might think i could be you know if i'm in a karaoke or on stage in a particular thing but I'm, i know i'm not i know what professional level means in, in my games job and i know i'm not there you know just because i want to be doesn't mean i deserve the right to say i am there hmm. and nor does it mean that i should have platforms around me telling me because you want to be it, you can be it you know like the concept that anyone if you want to be a game developer you you are a game developer you can be it's like yeah. It's not true, but so many people have made money over the years out of universities and conferences and other things, pushing this volume of people so they can draw money from their ambition, regardless of whether or not it's actually fulfilled in the long term, it's irrelevant. Mm. They're making money out of the process of them taking the journey. And that's been pushed so much now. I think it's kind of like telling a room full of people, go and buy a lottery ticket and you'll be a millionaire tomorrow. You know, It's exactly like that. Yeah. And, you know, and then you're getting people going, Oh, well, I went to university, I did my degree and I didn't really get a job out of it. But I'll tell you what I did get. I've got the 40 grand debt. And now, um, uh, and now I don't know what job I'm going to do. But, you know, and then you look at a generation up from you and you go, well, these guys used to be able to buy houses. Well, I can't buy, I can't afford a house now. It's like, because you've been conned. You mm -hmm. know, and, and then, and how, and you're on your life level, that's how it goes into your life. And on, an, on a practical level, that's how you get this huge sea of apps or huge amount of music or a huge amount of books or a huge amount of whatever, because the platform holders, and it's not so much the hardware companies as the pipelines that have the content going through them, have worked out they can do so much better by increasing the volume of that content.
you know, and that the market will find out what's at the top and what's at the bottom. Well, that's great. Or even seeing on my rant now, um, startups. So the concept that's of startups to me is horrendous. Like I've run businesses all my life. Startups, 90% of startups fail, mm -hmm. right? Imagine you walk down the high street and nine out of 10 shops in the high street are boarded up. That's what it looks like for 90% of things to fail. Mm -hmm. It looks like a disaster area. It's getting that way on the high street in the UK, actually. <laughs> well, that's, because of, that's because of COVID. But, I know, I know. But, but the reality is that this concept that failure is okay, mm. you know, I mean, that trying is everything and try and succeed and yeah, you're great, go for it. It doesn't matter if you fail or, it's, fail or succeed. It's bullshit. It's like, how can you feed a family by running a business which runs out of money? We go home and say, oh, sorry, no, no food for the kids, I've got no money. I mean, hmm. get wife, real. You, you like, Thanks for trying, you know. Sorry, little Timmy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In the old days, that's what would have happened. You'd have gone, well, you know that bakery I sold? Well, we sold three loaves of bread last month, and uh, that's it, you know. <laughs> I've got loads of bread, but we've got nothing else, you know. Eventually, the, you, would, you, you wouldn't do that, and you, you, would, you would look at someone and you'd laugh at them. Well, not laugh. You'd feel sorry for them, but you'd you'd see them as a failure. But now, the opposite is happening. People are encouraging people to enter businesses that got a ninety percent or more chance of failure, which means a lot of people have only experienced failure and failure as being normal and okay. That is very wrong. I mean, I've run businesses, like I say, all my life. Two businesses only: Sensible Software and Tail Studios. One thirteen years. And then since we're talking 13 years, Tower is now 17 years. In all that time, never had any, so far, touch with major problems with anything, you know, because making the right decisions, because not spending money if you haven't got it, because paying attention to little details, understanding that no one's going to bail you out, no one owes you a living, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and making sure that the decisions you're making, either you can afford to take a risk or, you, your thing's good enough that you can get some money coming in. And <clears throat> the kind of false early hope of giving someone 50 grand and saying, right, I'll take 40% 40, 40 of your company or 30% of your company for 50 grand. And then knowing that I've seen it with so many games companies, like they, they're on these little incubators. They get a bit of money, but it's not enough to really get a great demo of a game because you've got three or four guys and they need enough money for a year to get a decent demo of this thing done and the 50 grand is not going to cut it you know they're not going to be able to survive and do that at the same time so then they go to having to take a full-time job on which means they haven't got the time to do the work on the the game so in the end in general the money peters out for most of the companies and then their experience of this is well we tried it and everyone said yeah it's great go for it but it didn't really work or well, their game comes out and it's kind of all right but it's it's got into the market, so it's there in the market, but it's not really the whole thing, you know. And uh, and you, you add this volume of thinking up around the world, and you, you're getting, you know, tens of thousands of these, or hundreds of thousands, probably, of these failed things. And there's a whole weird mindset. Like, people get there going, I've still got my 40 grand student debt, and, like, you know, I... I'm nowhere further advanced in my life and my business has gone nowhere. And, and then you have to justify it to yourself. So you go, yeah, well, I failed, but that's all right. Everyone else around me is doing that. It's normal. But you're just being played mm. because the people investing the money know that you either hit it big or you fail. And if they get 19 failures and one success, that one success can pay for the 19 failures. And the, and the, and the other 19 are literally collateral damage. Mm. They just are. The system just is going to is going to make that happen, and to me, that's a that that leaves a very unbalanced business community, and a whole bunch of people um, feeling weird about this stuff, and and it's not normal. It's, like I say, it's not normal to be bailed out in that way, or it's not efficient use of money. So yeah, I mean, it's a different conversation entirely. But, no. <laughs> But yeah, I know, I know what you mean, a, a lot of that stuff, and you kind of see it in this thing, YouTube thing, that, as I was saying earlier, I work full-time, and it's a hobby, mm. but you see people come in, and they think, oh, 
I can just start a channel and I'll make loads of money. And you can't making money from it is like impossible. You know what I mean? You have to be huge. Yeah. But they see these few people who are, you know, uh, you know, in the media who yeah. are making like millions, and they think, oh, I can do that. And it's like, no, you can't. The, the, the chances of you doing that is so slim. It's like just get a job, you know, <laughs> and, and do it on the side. And if it did kick off, then that's happy days. But... And that's absolutely the way to do it. You're right, and uh, and you're right. Some people's some people's sense of proportion of maths basically is bad, or or they or, or they, they think that because they want something, it's reality. You know, that's become so normal in so many ways at the moment. You know that that this this I want it, therefore it must be real. Uh, it's like fantasy becoming reality and and you having to play as if it is you know because people expect that but eventually reality always wins in the end uh -huh. so at some point like the veil was pulled away it's like oh so that really was a reality you're right of course uh -huh. i mean if you you have to be very talented very lucky and very hard working to be successful at anything and most of us aren't you like with anyone can make a youtube video right but knowing what to do with that having the content good enough uh, having the the contacts to know where to put that to start to generate money in it is hard work, and you you need to be lucky. I think most of it is luck, you know. Like God knows how, what they do with the YouTube does with its algorithm rhythms and stuff to push stuff, but I mean it's completely completely luck. I think. But out of it, you might get out of these things, and I only know that because we've had it from games. But out of these new fads, if you like, I mean, computer games start off as a fad you do get genuinely talented people or groups of people pushing out through it that yeah they've really got something like you know everyone agrees you know he's really got it or she's really got it you know and it's interesting how when you when you look at um sport is a really good example it doesn't matter how many people watch sport everyone will agree that out of five different people who's the best footballer in the world at the moment because Everyone can see that extra bit of quality or with an artist or with a musician or with a writer or whatever. It just, it, it burns out of people. And often it doesn't last forever. Like even a Mike Tyson, who was like totally amazing when he first hit the boxing ring, eventually that burnt, that that genius part of him burn. I mean, now that he's brilliant, his quotes are brilliant, by the way. He says some really smart stuff. But um but that 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 time burn and it's like every a lot of bands have it you know or authors have it or us as game makers have it, like we had it in the middle of sensible you have these periods where you you hit a golden zone hmm. and, and we all know that and we all feel it as people and all this stuff about chucking loads of youtubers or um games or music or whatever it might be us is trying to it's trying to obscure that at the end of the day, we, we kind of really know what's great because it stands out a mile, you know, mm. it just does. I mean, it's kind of like a, it's kind of something people are trying to obscure because it goes against this content. Of, it goes against the concept of content pipelines and everything being replaceable. And I strongly felt when we were at the peak of what we we're doing with Sensible that um, people wanted to build big brands and for the brands to be big fair enough but more than that that the platform holders that came in in the mobile time really they care about the platform they don't care about the content they really it could be anything like there's no the concept of exceptionally great art if you like or great stuff great games was very secondary to that platform i think you do get games like fortnite recently the fortnite's really pushed out and been something big minecraft has done the same thing been really big um a lot of the stuff that supercell do on the mobile side is gets really really big i think the game which really nailed the platform the most probably was world of warcraft at its peak because it was extremely good at what it was doing so you you do get these things pushing out anyway because they're so so strong but yeah i think i think that we'd be happier as consumers to have less less choice as mm. well.
for sure. You know, me included. You know, I look at the I look at the TV channels sometimes, and I mean, I'm a big sport watcher, so I watch that, and then I look at the others and I go, "There's a whole bunch of reruns or things I've already seen. I might have already seen, and you know, there might be something good in there, but I can't be bothered to look. You know, can mm. you please give me less choice but guarantee its quality instead? Yeah, sometimes I mean, between like you know Amazon and Netflix and TV and Disney, it takes you just as long to look for something as it does that you end up watching it. You know, <laughs> and it, it happens in here even. I come in here and I'm like, oh, I'll play something because I've got too much crap in here, <laughs> and then I spent <laughs> spend far too long deciding what to play. And then setting the system up, and then it doesn't work right, and you're going to sit down and forget it. It's, yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy. You know, um, I think that. I think that we, I hope that in the next 50 years, we, it's weird because in a way, we've, we've got more choice, but it's all chucked in one bucket. It's like, have you ever been into a restaurant where you've got a hundred page menu? And people just look at it and go, can I have a burger, please? Because I actually can't be bothered to, like, go through all the pages. It's a bit like that. Uh, and, and that I'm restaurant like... will not do any of those things well because it's too much <laughs> on the menu. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know that as well. And it's all, like, in the freezer. They just pull out the freezer. <laughs> yeah. in, the um, in a way, the other big change, the other big shift in the market in recent times is the way I was thinking about this the other day that the way games are evaluated. So, like you look on a on a on a App Store, Steam, Google Play, whatever, and you'll see a game rating, and everyone's rated the game out of five stars or whatever. But what you got to think is that if they're free to play games, anyone can download a free to play game for nothing. Yeah, so people literally get them, download them, play them for five seconds, and chuck it away. Those people, if you're making, if you use heavy metal music as, a, as an, an analogy, heavy metal music, most people don't like it. But 10% of people really like it. Say, the, the numbers, roughly. It's a guess. but So you know you've got this very intense market, which is very loyal to it and loves it. And 90% of the people that you would never sell it to because you know they hate it. And... If you look over the years at album sales, that kind of music has like, sold incredibly well. Commercially, it's sold very well. It's very loved. It's very res respectable what they're doing artistically, you know, and commercially, it's very viable. And yet, under this current model where everything is judged by everybody, so you say to everybody, imagine that everybody download, downloads a heavy metal album on their phone. Do you like it? Like, nine out of ten people are going to go, I hate this one star. Yeah. So what you're what you're seeing is that reflected in the in what's coming to the top, which is the stuff which everyone can like, and also people are normally reviewing it within half an hour of first experiencing it. So anything which is complex and takes a while to grow into is very hard to sell under this system. Anything which is not mainstream is also very hard to sell because you get mainstream people judging a non-mainstream thing and hating it because it wasn't intended for them in the first place. So. It would also help to have more distinct fac factions, like you have horror movies or romance movies or sci-fi mu movies, and people watching it kind of know what they're getting, hmm. and and uh, and uh, and they're more judged within their genre than by the general public. You even see it on some. On, on I've been watching a lot of movies recently, so you see it on the on the sites that are reviewing them, that some of them are quite marked down, and it must be because people who wouldn't really normally be watching it are, are watching it, because you think the quality of it's high enough that, you know, it, mm. should be, it should be higher. So I think that we're getting, again, it's because of digital, and it's because of the payment mechanisms. We're getting people exposed to product that wouldn't normally be buying it to even evaluate it. They wouldn't even be engaging with it. And so it does slightly skew, you know, if you're thinking from a, a very platform holder, money oriented, how much money can we make this quarter mentality? 
you genuinely don't care which of your products is successful. You couldn't give a damn. Mm -hmm. you, you couldn't care if it's the worst thing in the world. You know, you couldn't care if all, all games are turned into Flappy Bird and that was all you could sell different colour Flappy Birds. That would be, that'd be great. You're just hedging your bets, basically, that well, the point some, is, some make... of them are going to be successful. Yeah, yeah. And, and if, if multicoloured Flappy Birds made more money than, <clears throat> than <clears throat> you know, than, uh, I don't know, the Last of Us and Minecraft and, and you know, whatever. They would go there in a heartbeat. They'd kill all these other things everyone loves mm -hmm. because the other stuff is making more money. But artistically, that's criminal, you know. So this is, this is what's so hard to, to, like, reconcile. In the old days, the people publishing the games and the channels publishing the games, by and large supported and were excited by the great new and interesting product and that's how in those sensible software times we were able to make a huge hugely diverse amount of uh, type of games backed by publishers backing up to put it out there because they were excited they were proper publishers you know they wanted a great stable of games on their label because that's how you made money and now the the, the people ultimately making the choices are so far away from that they're just a channel to push content through that's replaceable like that and they don't care about any of it you know and so it's not healthy artistically to have that leading the thought process so mm, i hope that we go back to a point where if you like there's slightly more elitism or snobbery in quality uh, because I preferred the world like that to it just money based, hmm. you know. And I think, I think, like I said, I think consumers do. I think consumers much prefer knowing that they're going to be given quality, knowing the dross has already been filtered out from them, you know, knowing that this this program's for them. It's not for everyone, but this one's for them. And um, we know you like this kind of stuff, so here you go. You, you'll probably like this, and, and 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 not worrying that all these other people don't like it when we'll fuck them anyway. We were never mm -hmm. trying to make this thing for them. Just, you know, go and do something else. Yeah. The, 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 rather than trying to please everyone with everything, which is what's kind of happening at the moment, which is ends up in this super, you know, averageness sometimes. Well, I hope so too. I hope it changes. Um, but yeah. Who knows? Who Did you knows? Have questions I've waffled on on that last um, one. Oh, I don't, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I think I think we've pretty much covered everything I wanted to cover. Okay. But yeah, cool. and, and I, I've already taken up way too much of your time. Yeah, Don, I know. So, I've got, yeah, I've been, oh, you're, you got me in waffle mode. So yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, I love the Amiga. Sensible software, just synonymous with the Amiga, and you know, one of mine and many people's favorite developers. Uh, from back then, so very fond. Thanks very members. much, and you're right. You're right. The Amiga was the best machine. Still, oh, still, it, even fun. today. Sure, yeah. sure, sure is. Yeah. Cheers, Great. mate. Thanks, Cheers. Mate. See Speak you soon. Cheers, bye. bye.